call the regular meeting of the Phoenix County Commission to order. Just want to point out that in the back of the room are copies of the agenda. There's also a speaker request form. So if there's an item that you'd like to speak on, you can fill out that form and turn it into Holly sitting at your right of the dais. And we will uh, start with a uh, moment of silent reflection and Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Roskinect. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Roskin. This time I'd like to call uh, Sheriff Tone. And friends. To the friend? <laughs> Morning, Rob. Good morning. Sorry, your sheriff. <laughs> Good morning, Kevin Tone, Pinty County Sheriff, and Rob Yantis, our jail commander. Um, thank you for recognizing our correctional staff for National Corrections Week. And uh, on the front side of that, we wanted to talk about um, one of our correctional officers that passed away last year. Uh, David Henry, and Rob's going to give you a little background on David, but uh, David died as a result of a you know, line of duty death, uh, contracted COVID while working in the jail, and uh, it's the only, uh, so far to date, it's the only line of duty death related to COVID in South Dakota for law enforcement, and uh, what the process is um, following his passing, there's a uh, a lot of documentation we work with the family and our office and submit to Department of Justice. And there's an approval process that, that goes through in January of this year. Uh, David was awarded that line of duty death recognition. And here today, also in Los Angeles waiver stand up, they, uh, they don't want to speak, but uh, Lori, his wife, Noni, the daughter, and Connie is Lori's mom. They're all three present here today. And, uh, so I want to recognize them. The, uh, the process from here is next week, David's name will be placed on the memorial wall in Pierre for all fallen law enforcement in South Dakota. And then next year in 2023, his name will be placed on the National Memorial Wall in Washington. And because of the timing, though he passed in September of last year, the approval didn't come to all early this year, so that bumps his name being placed on the wall in D.C. to the following year, so that's why it'll be in 2023. But Rob's going to give you a little background about him and his service to uh, our community and to our jail, and then we'll recognize our other staff, and one of them will read the proclamation. So, Rob? David Henry was hired as a correctional officer with the Pennington County Sheriff's Office in June of 2014. He was assigned to the Pennington County Jail and he was promoted to a senior correctional officer in June of 2018. Prior to joining the Sheriff's Office, David served in the United States Coast Guard from 1987 to 2010. Following his service, he completed a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and held positions with the Rapid City Police Department, the Weber County Sheriff's Office and Clearfield Job Corps in Utah. In November of 2018, David was selected as the Pennington County Employee of the Month due to his attitude and willingness to help his coworkers accomplish their duties. In February of 2021, David was again awarded the Employee of the Month after his attention to detail and quick action played a pivotal role in providing rapid emergent medical care, likely saving a life. CEO David Henry tested positive for COVID-19 on September 1st, 2021, after being assigned to a housing unit with inmates who tested positive for COVID-19. Correctional Officer David Henry passed away on September 14th, 2021. David and his wife, Lori, enjoyed 40 years of marriage. They have three grown children, two daughters and a son. I wanna thank you for taking a moment to honor David Henry this morning. At this time, I'd like to invite our correctional officers to come forward.
I'd like to introduce these fine folks to you. Uh, my name is Rob Yantis. I'm the jail commander. I've been there for 14 years. Officer Casey Ballard, I've been here for six years. Officer Andrew Rodaro, I've been here 16 years. Officer David Rubin's been for uh, 21 years. Good morning, I'm Joe Gutierrez, commander of JSC, 11 years. Uh, Officer Curtis Stalker, just six months. I'm Officer Llewellyn Longwolf, and I've been here for four years. Um, I'm Sergeant Swagger. I've been with the Sheriff's Office for three years, and I'm going to be reading the proclamation. All right. Whereas May 1st through May 7th, 2022, will be celebrated across the United States as National Corrections Week. And whereas the corrections profession is one of the most challenging professions one can pursue, it is also one of the most noble. Corrections staff help our citizens and our communities stay safe, not only simply by securing jails and juvenile detention facilities and other offenders confined therein. Correctional employees serve admirably throughout the Pennington County Jail and the Juvenile Services Center as custody officers, counselors, teachers, chaplains, healthcare professionals, support staff, supervisors, and commanders. They're among the most capable, committed, patient, persistent public servants in our nation, and whereas few truly understand the difficulties and challenges these correctional professionals face, often at a personal risk. They are given those who are engaged in dangerous and addictive behaviors, along with the responsibility to reform and rehabilitate. They are given the society's illiterate and unskilled and are tasked to educate. They are given those who lack medical care and who are poor in health and must help make them well. They are given the mentally ill and responsible to diagnose, treat, and protect. Correctional staff are in a position to offer offenders a better example and new path. These staff do so with limited resources and often with little awareness or acknowledgement for those who are outside the field of corrections. Yet correctional employees continue to rise to the challenge time and time again. Whereas it is appropriate we honor correction staff in our Pennington County correctional facilities for the invaluable contribution to society. Now, therefore, we, the Board of County Commissioners, County of Pennington County, South Dakota, do hereby proclaim May 1st through May 7th as 2022 as Pennington County Corrections Week and encourage the citizens of Pennington County to share and acknowledge the outstanding job Pennington County Corrections staff perform on a daily basis in serving our entire community. Dated this May 3rd, May 2022. Thank you. On behalf of Pennington County, I want to thank each and every one of you correction officers and all of your colleagues uh, that aren't here in the room today. We appreciate the service that you do provide. We know that it's not easy work. We appreciate you doing it. I see we have a range from six months to 21 years, I think is what I heard. Um, it's, it's a lot of service. We, we thank you for it. And uh, thank you for being here for, for this. And I think I would ask if we can come down and, and have a picture taken with everyone. And I will present the uh, sheriff with the, uh, or Rob with the actual signed proclamation. Here. Um, they would better cross the front. Yeah, let's try and squeeze Is into maybe one corner. <coughs> oh, well, I want to be taller than him. It's very <laughs> if you stay right there. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. In addition, I'd also like to uh, recognize David Henry and his family. Lori, I appreciate you being here today, you and your family. Our condolences to you. Uh, uh, tough loss, we, but we appreciate you being here and uh, wish you Godspeed ahead. Thank you. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Hancock. Um, I also would like to thank the Pennington County Correction uh, people, our deputies, um, for their service, their outstanding job. Uh, also for David Henry, who's with us a long time. Also for his service in the Coast Guard as well. Uh, appreciate everything he's done for Pennington County and our team. Uh, he will be well missed. And we just wanted to thank him for his service as well as the rest of our team uh, for their correctional services today. So appreciate you all being here. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. I'd like to call uh, Brian Mueller forward. Uh, Brian, uh, we're also dealing with the uh, law enforcement uh, torch run for the Special Olympics in South Dakota. We have to make a motion first. So, for the uh, I'm sorry. Please do. We'll make a motion first. Mr. Chair, I'd make a motion to approve the proclamation. Second. We've got a motion and a second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Now, Brian. Good morning. Brian Mueller, Chief Deputy, Pennington County Sheriff's Office. Well, a lot of emotions today and a lot to unpack, and we appreciate your support and continued attention as we work through the agenda today. So, as you know, the uh, Special Olympics has a special place in our heart here in Pennington County at the Sheriff's Office. We have a longstanding relationship of working with the organization, helping raise money and awareness throughout Western South Dakota, throughout the state of South Dakota, and throughout the nation. And uh, we have the uh, torch run coming up here, and I'm going to read a proclamation here in a minute that will give a little bit of background and history on that. And then also, I think this could be a good time. You know, every year we do the polar plunge. Local law enforcement and the community gets together and does a polar plunge in, a, in an effort to raise uh, awareness and money for Special Olympics. And I think I'm going to throw a challenge out there this year. I think we need a county commission team at the polar plunge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we'll I, touch I think we're after the challenge. I think you probably are. It's a lot of fun. I've done it for several years. This last year almost felt like it was cheating. It was like jumping into a bathtub, but there's years it hasn't been that same experience. So <laughs> with your permission, I'd like to read the proclamation. Absolutely. Whereas the law enforcement torch run began in 1981 when Wichita, Kansas police chief Richard <coughs> Lemonian created the torch run with the thought it would help law enforcement be active in the community and support Special Olympics Kansas. In 1983, Chief Lemunyan presented the program to the International Association of Chiefs of Police, IACP. They decided to endorse Torch Run and become the founding law enforcement organization. With the IACP support, the law enforcement Torch Run became the movement's largest public awareness and fundraiser, fundraising group for Special Olympics. Whereas the South Dakota Law Enforcement Torch Run is the grassroots fundraising campaign to raise awareness and funds for the Special Olympics South Dakota programs. And whereas Special Olympics program is a year round athletic competition in which over 2,750 individuals with disabilities from South Dakota compete in various athletic events. And whereas in 2020, 22, the Torch Run event and other fundraising activities raised over $454,560 for Special Olympics South Dakota. And whereas the 2022 Law Enforcement Torch Run in Rapid City on May 19th honors the Special Olympic athletes participating in the 2022 State Summer Games, May 19th through May 21st, 2022. And whereas, known as the Guardians of the Flame, Law enforcement members and Special Olympics athletes carry the flame of hope into opening ceremonies of local competitions. A core group of runners from around the state will finish the game's opening ceremony in Spearfish, South Dakota on Thursday, May 19th, 2022. Now, therefore, we, the Pennington County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the week of May 16th through May 20th, 2022 as Law Enforcement Torch Run for Special Olympics South Dakota Week. Thank you for your Thank time you. and your attention. 
And uh, we are going to have a, a, a small ceremony on the 19th here where, where we'll do a, a short run here in Rapid City, and we'll get that invitation out to you folks so you can be present at that if you wish. Super. Thank you. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Can I have a motion to approve the uh, chair's signature on Oops, that executive proof. proclamation? I second. got a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, <laughs> indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, Lloyd, Commissioner Thank LaCroix, would you uh, handle the next proclamation, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, we're going to do an executive proclamation for Pennington County, South Dakota Public Service Recognize, Recognization Week. <clears throat> May 1st through the 7th of 2022. Whereas each year since 1985, the US Congress designates this week of May as Public Service Recognition Week, time set aside to honor public employees and to educate the public about the many ways government workers may make life better for all the Americans. And whereas Americans are served every single day by public servants at the federal, state, county, and city levels. These unsung champions do the work that keep our nation's, nation working, and whereas the men and women who work for our government tackle some of the most important challenges and opportunities facing our country, and whereas public employees take not only jobs, but oaths, and whereas with these public servants at every level, Continuity with be impossible in a de democracy that regularly changes in leaders and elected officials. Whereas Pennington County Board of Commissioners is extremely proud of the dedication shown by its employees day in and day out, they provide the diverse services de demanded by the American people of their government with efficiency and integrity. The board chooses to honor all county employees who exemplify this, the significant and invaluable contributions public servants make to the quality of life of our country, our county. And now, therefore, we, the Pennington County Board of Commissioners of Pennington County, South Dakota, do hereby proclaim May 1st through May, tw May 7th, 22, as Public Service Recognition Week. All citizens are encouraged to recognize the accomplishments accomplishments and contributions of the government employees at all levels, federal, state, county, city. Join us this week throughout the year in showing them the respect, the respect and appreciation they seldom receive, yet richly deserve. Thank you, Commissioner LaCroix. Do I have a motion to uh, authorize the chair's signature on that uh, Public Service Recognition Week proclamation? Move to approve. Thank you. We've got a motion and a uh, Second. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Adcock. I'd also like to recognize our employees here at Pennington County. Um, do a great service for our community. Um, work very hard and diligently to try to serve um, our people here. Um, I'm very proud of our team here at Pennington County. Um, they work very hard for us. Um, our department heads, um, top notch. <coughs> So I'd just like to thank for all their service. There's a lot of work that goes into serving the public every day and serving people with a smile every day. So um, I'd just like to recognize the people that do that for us. And uh, a lot of them in Pennington County, our team has been in, we've had people in here for 33 and 34 years. I mean, that shows some dedication for the people that uh, love our county and, and love the people they serve. So we appreciate them very much today and this week. Thank you, Commissioner Adcock. Adcock. Appreciate it. Uh, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Now we need to back up. Uh, I failed to uh, uh, have the review and, and approval of the uh, agenda. Is there any public comment relative to the uh, agenda? Seeing none, back to the commission. Can I get a motion to... Uh, approve the agenda for today. Mr. Chair, move to approve the agenda. Uh, I got a motion and a second for the discussion. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Holly, consent agenda. Hi. 
Excellent. Good morning, Commissioners. Holly Haney is Commission Manager. For public notice, the Board of Commissioners uses a consent agenda to act on non-controversial and routine items. The consent agenda is acted upon by one motion and vote of the Board. Items may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda at the request of a Board member or a citizen. Today's consent agenda contains the following three items. Approval of the minutes from the regular meeting of April 19th, 2022. Approval of the minutes of the Board of Equalization hearings held in April 2022. And number 10 is to approve the operating transfer from the general fund to the emergency management fund in the amount of $122,124. Are there any members of the public that wish to have any one of these three items removed from the consent calendar so it can be uh, open for discussion? Being none, is there any commissioners wanting to have those removed? Not, I'd take a motion to approve the consent agenda. So move. Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Regular agenda items is item number 11. And um, I'm going to ask uh, for those that are here if they would come forward and uh, identify themselves and tell us a little bit about your uh, willingness to volunteer for uh, a committee that we've established on vacation home rentals. And so the names that I have here is, uh, is Tara Flannery here. Tara, come on forward, please. Uh, Jessica Ginger. Jordan Hirschfeld. Laura Jones. Cecil Peterson. Christopher Quayle. And Kathy Skorzewski. Go ahead and just step up to the mic, identify yourself. I'm going to open it for anybody that has questions. Of okay. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, I'm Tara Flannery. I'm a lifelong resident of Rapid City and the Black Hills. And uh, I'm really interested in this committee because I think it's a very important topic. I think it's important to find a good balance um, for our community and uh, just to put, put the work into it. So... I'm honored to, to serve on this committee. Thank you. Any questions of Tara? Oh, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Good morning. Um, I'm Jessica Ginger. I've been a resident of Pennington County for 14 years. Um, I'm actively involved in the vacation rental um, business. And um, I believe that I want to serve because I believe that um, we need to, this is such a growing business in the county and we need uh, stronger regulation and compliance enforcement and um, just to um, ease the minds of everybody involved on both sides. So that's what I'm looking forward to helping with. Super, any questions of Jessica? Oh, welcome. Thank you yep. for coming. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jordan Hirschfeld. Uh, I, too, am act actively involved in the vacation rental business. Um, this is a growing trend. Uh, I think it's good growth, um, and uh, I'm here to serve the public in trying to come to some, uh, I think, middle ground with the public and with the city on, on uh, figuring out what, what's appropriate um, to better serve the community here, here of Pinson County. So grateful for the opportunity as well. Thank you, Jordan. Any questions, Jordan? Oh, welcome. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Good morning, Laura Jones. Um, I'm also a, the housing coordinator at Elevate Rapid City. And so obviously I have a very strong interest in this committee to see how vacation home rentals impact the housing stock and how we can help strike that balance to better both sides of the coin. So. Thank you, Laura. I have a question for you. Sure. With your previous work, did you have a background at all in vacation home rentals? Was no. That part of okay. No, I have a master's in public administration though, with a specialization in state and local government. Um, so policies are my thing. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Laura. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Laura. Welcome. It. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Chris Quayle. I'm a realtor here in Rapid City, and I'm also involved with short-term rentals and long-term rentals. I've uh, been in the area since 2006. And I think it's a complex problem that's going to need a big picture solution, and I'm excited to help with it. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions of Chris? No, just thank say thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Chris. 
Good morning. My name is Dessel Peterson. I know it's an unusual name. <laughs> I've been a resident of the county for about eight years. Before I moved here, I was the city attorney for the city of Minnetonka, Minnesota, which is one of the suburbs of Minneapolis. Wow. And I had a lot of years of drafting, zoning, and planning ordinances. I currently live in a neighborhood that has two vacation home rentals, and I can see the pluses and minuses of both of those. And I think there is some room for some improvement in the ordinance, and I'd like to help do that. I okay. appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Kathy Skorzewski, and I'm a leader in Hill City. I've been in the county and in Hill City for almost seven years now. Um, I'm very excited and very grateful that the commission has recognized this as an area of opportunity for us. Um, I as personally as a leader in Hill City, we are going through the same issues that a lot of other areas are. And uh, Hill City, unfortunately, has a geographic limit that we have um, with all of the mountains and hills that we have. So it's not easy for the town to spread. I do believe that there is a very equitable solution for this. I understand and realize both sides. Um, as, as a leader, my heart really is with the residents and understanding what the needs are. However, I do believe as a business and in particular, the fact that we are driven by uh, commercial businesses in our area, um, there is a way that we can strike that balance and we can provide an equitable solution to all those involved. As, as mayor of Hill City, I think you bring a little bit of a unique perspective to this because I know that you're working through some of the issues with the vacation home rentals within your own community, let alone in the county. So that appreciate you stepping forward. And Thank you very much. It. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Roskinek. I just might mention that these citizen interest forms that I'm looking at, I was really impressed by the education that some of these applicants had, a master's degree, bachelor's degree, and, and their actual experience in the vacation home uh, rental business. So uh, it had to be a tough choice going through all these applications, but I just want to welcome all the uh, new committee members. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. I, I too would like to thank the committee. I mean, it looks like a very well-rounded committee. And I, I just wanted to express some of my, a little bit of my concerns as you start out. <coughs> you know, as, as times are changing and we talk a lot about this being a business, take a good look at it as being as a way to help uh, residents stay in their property also and as being able to get some income to help stay on the property as duals. I think our community's getting some of that or working through some of that. So kind of keep that in mind, please. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Edgar. This isn't going to be an easy committee, I'll tell you. Um, ask Miss Brittany. She's smiling back there. I've been here through a couple of these since I've been a commissioner for vacation home rentals. So um, to me, the committee looks very balanced. Um, Looks like a lot of people that have the experience in this, and even when you don't, it's very interesting to learn, and uh, people giving their input um, from that, just from the committee that, like I said, even if you don't know about vacation home rentals a whole lot, once you start researching, it's pretty interesting what the, <clears throat> what I should say, um, how it's uh, evolved <laughs> to where it is today. And we do need living areas for people in the Black Hills and the surrounding areas of Pennington County. So it's gonna be essential that that is updated with what's going on around in our community. So I think change is ready uh, to move forward in vacation home rentals and this committee, like I said, very balanced. Looks like a committee that's ready to go to work. Uh, you'll have to roll up your sleeves and ask Brittany, you'll probably be at a lot of meetings. It's very contentious a lot of time, but I think in the long run, this committee uh, will get it done for us. And we appreciate you guys serving us on this committee. So thank you for your service as well. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Roskinick. To me, it's uh, finding the balance because we're talking about property rights. We're talking about the folks that want to have the right to do the vacation home rental. We want, we're talking about the neighbors. And when that committee can sit there and uh, that scale of justice, get that equal balance, then I think the committee has uh, hit a home run. Do I have a motion? Move for approval. 
Second. I got a motion and a second. Uh, any public comments in regard to this? Seeing none, back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, the committee is now formed. Ollie, do we have, have you talked about dates as to when their first meeting would be? Or? Um, Brittany will be in contact with them to get the okay. first one scheduled. Very good. Brittany? <laughs> <laughs> Our fearless leader. <laughs> Brittany Molitor, planning director. Um, I'm looking at Thursday afternoons. Um, they will be on the committee schedule, the weekly schedule, so they will be open to the public. Uh, Charlie Johnson, um, he is on our planning commission, has agreed to help facilitate those meetings. Um, so they will be scheduled for Thursday afternoons. Um, or they're going to be probably every week at least, uh, if not, um, if we can't, every other week. But that's what our plan is. So thank you, Brittany. Mm -hmm. Super. Thank you. Do they have homework? Do they have homework? They will, homework. I'm sure they will have homework. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for being here, introducing yourselves. Appreciate your service. Item 12, uh, sealed bid opening. Uh, Commissioner LaCroix, I'm going to give this to you. Uh, this is for a tax deed number 27437, located at 684 North Spruce Street in Rapid City. Uh, my understanding is we received only the one bid. Uh, that bid is now being opened by Commissioner LaCroix. Bid for a property located at 684 North Spruce Street, Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, by Danielle Shore. Dan Shore. Oh, Dan. Yep, Dan. Okay, Daniel Shore. Uh, 4793. Wow, Somerset. Uh, his bid is six thousand five hundred dollars. Okay, so we have a bid from Daniel Shore in the amount of sixty five hundred dollars. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Adcock. Move to award the sale of tax ID 2747 to Dan Shear for the sealed bid received in the amount of 6000 what? 500. 500. 500. And to issue the deed per the condition detailed in the public notice of sale. Second. We got a motion and a second. Is there any public comment in regard to this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Next item is on the agenda is the Central States Fair report. Ron Jeffries. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Appreciate your time here today. Uh, I wanted to first uh, let you know that I provided an updated uh, list of our directors and staff with Holly. She'll get that to you. So it's got contact information for everyone on our board and staff members here. Um, I wanted to point out that uh, our election of officers that took place at our annual meeting in March uh, we ha now have Tyler Trevelyan and A.G. Edwards uh, person as our president. Our vice president is Jerry Cope from Dakota Mill and Green. Our secretary is Tanner Schilder, and he's a nurse anesthetist at Monument Health. And our treasurer is Casey Gerlach, and she's a partner with uh, uh, Casey Peterson here in Rapid City uh, CPAs. We also elected three new board members, Anna Wetham from Monument Health, um, Justin Tupper, the manager from St. Ange Livestock, and uh, Kelby Lang, a retired National Guard and uh, works for Black Hills Energy. Uh, I just provide those as information for you so you have contact information should you need it. I also wanted to take a minute and introduce uh, Rhonda Tag. Rhonda's our finance officer here. She joined us. To, your anniversary's coming up. Tomorrow. Yeah. So her anniversary for one year will be uh, tomorrow. And when I hired her, one of the questions I asked her is, are you durable? Um, she had great skill set, but I said, are you durable? And she said, durable? Yeah, I'm durable. And uh, 364 days in, we'll know tomorrow if she makes it one year. But uh, she's, done a, she's done a great job for us, uh, pleasant to work with, and been a great addition to our Central States Fair staff team. Um, I think you received a copy of the audit that we uh, 
was conducted by Cato Thorsonson, and I'm going to just cover a couple of bases with you. First off, I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. Um, so sometimes these things get a little bit combobulated for me, particularly when uh, they combine past numbers that have been our, we have a fiscal year that runs October 1 through September 30. But we work with the county who has a January 1 to November 31, or December 31. So we end up with some of our budget items are budgeted in one year, but collected in what would be our next fiscal year. Well, that's why we have auditors to separate those pieces out and go through and find, uh, find the pieces that went with it. I'll tell you that the audit was conducted by Cato Thorsonson. We did receive our letter as an unqualified audit. When I first started, I thought that was a bad thing, but I've come to learn over the several years that unqualified means that they gave their opinion about the financial condition of Central States Fair, Inc. and Central States Fair Foundation without any qualifications. So it's an unqualified audit, um, a couple of pieces of corrective action that we can take within that, but nothing that would be out of the norm within any other given audit. The audit itself was several pages worth of information, and I provided those uh, to you through the electronic. And I would certainly let you know that if we want to go to, into detailed report about what each of the line items mean, I would like to schedule a special meeting with our auditor present so you can go through that. But to recognize that Cato Thorstenson is a, a highly respected auditing firm here in Rapid City, and this is, I, I think it's about our 20th year of unqualified audits. Uh, first few years were shaky, if you remember, we had uh, severe debt and there were a lot of things that we were learning how to do and, and trying to provide for safeguards uh, uh, cash flow safeguards with not enough staff members. Uh, over the years, this has changed. In the first few years, we got through it. And since then, we've had an unqualified audit every year. Um, very proud of that from both of our accounting staff and from the collective efforts of our board of directors and our finance officer. I do have for you what I used at our retreat, if I may, Mr. Chairman. So I used a, re uh, a report that gives you a visual the visual is just basically a pie chart to let you know how we generate revenues and how our revenues flow. And this was from uh, last year, 2021. Um, you can see in the, in the pie chart that the uh, annual income from general and operating expenses, we operated a loss for the maintenance and care of the fairgrounds and, and general operating activities, insurance, gas, oil, uh, D Department of Corrections paid for the uh, use of uh, state Department of Corrections volunteers, um, our staffing, etc. cetera. Um, we operated a loss at about $660,000 a year. And then we make up for that loss through the rental of the event center. Um, and that you'll see was a positive net rent of 256612 for income. I'll tell you that that does include a good portion of our liquor inventory, our liquor revenues go through the event center for events that are held there. Um, it does not include the stalling. The stalling, which is another big gener generator for us through the event center, that does go into general administrative. All the payroll for our normal staffers falls into general administrative. We do not, in, in, in this visual, we don't take portions of Rhonda's time or my time or John Kaiser, my assistant manager's time, and spread those amongst the events. And we don't do that because it's, it gives you an uh, imperfect comparison from year to year to year if we take 33% one year and account for the stock show and the next year is 35%. Then it becomes a, math, a mathematical challenge to calculate and compare those different years of, of uh, wages. So we combine them all in general administrative and then give you a clear look of what did what activities took place around the operation of the event center, the production of Central States Fair, and the production of the Black Hills Stock Show. It does mean that when we hire um, part-time people to come help with the stock show, those wages go into stock show. We hire part-time people for the fair, those wages go into the fair, but not our general staff and operations. That stays in general administrative. So you can see the event center made about $250,000, $256,000. The stock show netted about 553,000 last year, and the fair netted about 333,000 last year. Those, those revenues are what help us keep a balance. When we have successful fairs and successful stock shows, we have additional monies left over, and those additional monies then will direct towards other improvements or projects on the Central States Fairgrounds or the Penalty County Fairgrounds, actually. Um, we did this last year receive some CARES money 
um, that helped us. We had uh, $361,000 that we received a year ago that was, um, we applied for, we, applied, we didn't become eligible until the third round. But in the third round, we were able to receive some CARES money. And last year's fair, that, not, that's in 2020, um, actually we had a negative balance at the end of the fair of about 25,000. So you can see it was quite a swing for us um, during that COVID year, but a number of other activities, we did step up and with the receiving of that CARES money, it did help us maintain a positive budget um, for last year as well. <clears throat> the, uh, the overall um, condition of the fair continues to improve. Uh, one of the items that was located in the, in the audit was the addition of the new stall barn number nine. Another item that showed up in here was the stall barn for repair, showed up as an all expense. But um, if you remember, we were looking at some, having some uh, contractors come in and produce that work. And, and quite honestly, it was, a, it was a very fine work, but we simply didn't have the cash funds to do it and, and didn't have a line item uh, lined out for it. Uh, we produced the work internally using all of our own staff, purchasing our materials uh, as well and we're able to cut that down by about a third of the original bid. So it was a significant difference in what the cost of, of uh, repairing that in the market would have been. Uh, and that again is because we've got really good staff. Um, another item that, that uh, is in here is that um, all the youth activities that come to that stock show, they're not money-making activities, but they come back in and I think are important to things like producing the stock show. Um, the other piece that uh, goes forward with this next year, this year, uh, the city of Rapid City did provide us with uh, just under a million dollars um, for improvements on what we call the west side of the campus, which will include primarily start with the Soule building and work its way around. In addition for this calendar year, uh, the Pennington County, if you recall, allotted an additional $250,000 for capital projects. Um, we just accepted the first um, bid on the Alfalfa Palace to reside that and put in new windows and, and replace the, the wood that's been rotting out around that, that facility. Um, when you come to the fair this year, we'll, you'll notice a number of different improvements throughout the grounds, and we look forward to uh, making that another successful year coming through this 2022 season. So I'll stand for questions. Any questions? Chairman. Commissioner right. Edgar. Not really a question, but um, <clears throat> John Kaiser with uh, Mr. <laughs> Ron Jeffries. Um, secured two times the vision fund from city of Rapid City, and I think that was um, a very good and nice plus for Rapid City. Um, and I thank them for recognizing how much uh, our fairgrounds contributes to sales tax and economic development for Rapid City. So um, everything that you guys do out there is pretty amazing. Um, again, people that are country folk, ag people, it's one of the number one industries in South Dakota. Um, you recognize that, and I think the people in Rap Rapid City and the surrounding area for Pennington County and the state understand that as well. So we've come a long ways in the last uh, five to eight years on people um, stepping up, uh, our team up front here, as well as the community in Rapid City. So we thank everybody for recognizing how much ag and our ag people contribute to us. And Ron, you've been a, a good advocate for that, pushing through. So appreciate everything that you and your team there do for our county and our fairgrounds. Mr. Chair. Thanks, thanks, Commissioner Hadcock. I appreciate that. And, and you, you bring up a good point. You know, most of the time, people that are not affiliated with the fairgrounds think it's that buildings out there that gets utilized once in a while for a horse event, and then we have a fair there. So we went on our retreat, uh, uh, our staff retreat, and we talked about the use of the fairgrounds. Last year, we had 280 days of rental days on the fairgrounds. That's days that we had to have somebody on the grounds because we, we had some part of the fairgrounds rented. We had two open weekends available in the, in the entire calendar for the event center, and one of those was Christmas. The other one was the rally, and the, 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 what we ran into with the rally was there, the promoter couldn't find uh, you know, enough hotels at a rate to make it work, uh, so backed out of that contract kind of late in the game. But um, otherwise, the facility is busy constantly. I gave a report on our, our May monthly activities. One day on the fairgrounds that we didn't have a rental activity going on. Now, June, we got a lot more. We have four. <laughs> so we have four days in June that we don't have a, a rental activity going on. And it's, and it's literally everything. It's from the citywide garage sales to a number of horse year, uh, events, uh, motorcycle races. We just started another group that came to us for cart races. 
Um, we are we are the host facility for the Marshalls football practice uh, two days a week. Um, there's a number of youth activities that take place, and and it's it is uh, amazingly busy, and we're grateful for that. Thank you, Ron. So, Ron, I want to I want to just uh, extend my appreciation for you and the entire staff, uh, your setup crew, your teardown crew. They do amazing work. Uh, I don't know how they get it all done in order to tear down from one event to be set up for the next, but they get it done. Really appreciate it. Well, the one note to that is it's appropriate that it's Corrections Week here because uh, we do use the, the State Department of Corrections volunteers. Um, they're not required to come to work for us. They have to volunteer to come to work for the fairgrounds. Um, we pay a dollar and a quarter an hour for each of those persons to come help. Without their help, would, it would be impossible to keep up that pace. Uh, the department uh, volunteer gets a quarter and the dollar goes to the state for funding the entire uh, corrections program. That's excellent. Just chair. Good report. Commissioner LaCroix. You know, I'll ditto on everything that's been said, but, but one thing I like about this <clears throat> audience, uh, Ron, is that they, they're not meant to dig anybody, but they give you things to work on if, if there's some deficiencies or things that you need to look at. And that, as I was reading through this one, I see that you have some. And you're doing these yearly, so I think that that's good. But what steps do you take when you get these reports? Do you, do you are you taking like with the one with the parking, keeping track of the parking, that type of stuff? Sure. Um, parking is one of the ones that we receive two deficiencies typically. And one of them is that we don't do our own um, creation of materials for the audit. We actually have Cato Thorsonson come back in. Uh, Rhonda spends a week with two of their representatives in our office going through all the different records and, and doing checks on each of the different types of accounts. That's the first one, and most nonprofits don't, don't have the staffing to do their own creation of the audit and material. The second one is our parking. Um, we've got uh, paid parking on the east side of the fairgrounds, and, and we, we literally just bring them in, and as they come in, they pay their dollar or pay their five dollars parking fee and go in. We don't use the little ripoff ticket and piece to do that. Everybody that has the premier pass or the VIP pass, that's in, in parking's included. And so the amount of money that it would take for us to go back out and set in place and the time it would take to, to ticket and provide a, a license plate with each of the people that come back in and give them a receipt would slow that down. So for the amount of money that we raise, and it's about forty thousand dollars in parking, so it's a significant number. But we work with a lot of nonprofits. We don't hire people at you know, minimum wage to go out there and stand to do those. We typically work with nonprofits to do th those types of jobs and got jobs within our gates. And what that does, it brings an organization that's here to work on behalf of their nonprofit organization to use it as a fundraising mechanism. And we tend to be able to, to quote, hire a better volunteer than if we'd gone back out and tried to provide minimum wage to, to put that in place. Yeah, I was just bringing it. Yeah. I like audits because they give us something, you know, so often we get doing the same thing, same thing, and, and they bring things to light, and uh, hopefully we can improve things. Sometimes there are explanations for them, and I think you made some, so. One more note to that, and it won't take any more time, but one more note to that is that that's why it's so important to work on your board of directors and get the right people in the right places. I mean, we've been very fortunate the last several years of bringing good, qualified people, just like the applicants you had to serve on your uh, on your VRBO um, board. We've got a lot of, and many of you have been at that, at that table with us. Um, we bring really good board members on to help us work through these things with lots of different skill back, backgrounds. You know, last year we brought in a retired banker. Um, Casey Gerlach, as I mentioned, is a CPA. We've got an attorney. We've got business minds. We've got ranching minds. We've got uh, community-minded people. So a real good, diverse board and a large board to work with. And uh, we've been very fortunate to have their input and oversight on this process. Chairman, uh, this, Commissioner Edgar. this might be off subject, but um, the Hawthorne Ditch area, you guys filled that in. Um, that's really cleaning up nicely. What are you using that for? So for we'll run some overflow parking back into that area, but um, uh, it's not to clean out, the, to clear cut the whole area. It's back in here. We've got to go back in and remove some stumps, but that was uh, quite a... Uh, a um, plant nightmare, I'll call it. Uh, it was really overgrown and underutilized and under cared for, quite honestly, and we hope to bring that back in and rehab that into a, 
uh, more natural place where in any afternoon in the summer you go out in the fairgrounds, you'll find 10 to 14 people pulled over parked to just have their lunch. Okay. And this will be one more spot on the east side that they'll be able to pull off and that little circle there, you see them there almost any time of day. They'll be able to pull down to the shaded area in the grass and have lunch or visit or whatever they're doing. Well, people like so. to fish and then I walk through that area and it's, it is very nice the way you guys are cleaned it up. So just want to thank you for that because that's more um, area, like you said, for parking or area that the community can use. So I appreciate that. It looks very nice. Thank you. Can I have one more leaning seat? Absolutely. All right. So this is the last one. The last one, I promise. So uh, one thing that doesn't show up in our audit, and we're very proud of this, is on any given year, we donate about $120,000, a little over every year, to other nonprofits, other organizations that come to need the use of the fairgrounds. That not a rental activity, but it's everything from a Western Junior to the law enforcement, uh, traffic stop training, to uh, um, dog training to uh, a number of youth activities. We contribute to, to programs that are looking for raffle prices for fundraisers. And that, that daily support of the community is about 120 plus thousand a year. Uh, last year was more like 150,000 because we did some additional work with the Black Hills Playhouse that needed some, some support and the type of resources we could provide. But we're very proud of that number. It just doesn't show up in an audit report. So as, as do as our economic impact numbers don't show up in an audit report, but there's still something to be considered when you're looking at the overall picture and purpose of the fairgrounds. Thank you, Ron. Thank Appreciate you all for coming. Sure. Thanks, Rhonda. Nice to have you here. Next item we have is uh, Cheryl Chapman. Come on up. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today to give a brief update about progress in bringing Missouri River water to Western South Dakota. I want to thank you because you were one of the very first uh, organizations to express support for this effort to get underway just a little over a year ago. And we've made tremendous progress, and I want to share that with you. I won't go back and give a lot of history about Missouri River water and its importance as an amazing resource to all people in South Dakota. But I'll, I will skip back a little ways. Um, and some of you might recall even when we had conservancy sub-districts in the state of South Dakota to really take a look at water on behalf of its citizens. And in this particular slide, uh, that pink area was the original Black Hills Conservancy sub-district formed in 1965. Just to give you context, um, that was about a decade after the dedication of the last main stem dam on the Missouri River. And so a lot of talk about water and how it can be used to benefit South Dakotans and also be managed through those dams to prevent the destruction of floods, uh, which South Dakota had so many of prior to that. It was, however, dissolved in 1984 and replaced by water development districts. And so you'll see the blue hash line is the West Dakota Water Development District, which is here in Pennington County, east, or excuse me, west of the Cheyenne River. As you know, that group elects its directors uh, during the general elections and uh, meets on a regular basis to look at these projects. There's also West River, the West River Water Development District. The names are very similar, but a different area just east of there. And when there was the conversion from the Conservancy sub-districts to the Water Development Districts, that water permit that was held by the Conservancy Subdistrict for 10,000 acre feet a year, a future use permit, was transferred to the new West Dakota Water Development District. And it is that permit that really helped jumpstart this current 
conversation about water in Western South Dakota. It was uh, about in 2017 that the West Dakota Water Development Board was getting ready to renew its future use water permit. And usually it's a pretty routine action. But the board at that point said, let's ask the South Dakota School of Mines, now South Dakota Mines, um, to take a look at this. Do we really need to renew that permit? And, and ask them their opinion from a technical perspective. And that research group came back, and this particular slide kind of says it all. It, it shows uh, a... Um, let me just try and move that up a bit. It shows the available water versus demand. The black line that's on an angle coming up in the graph shows how much water was used. And the dashed line that continues after 2020 is the projected use. The cone, the shaded cone that is there, is kind of a range of use that is projected. We kind of think we're on the high side of that because of the population growth seen in Pennington County. And keep in mind, this particular report from South Dakota Mines was provided in 2019. So it's already a few years old, and we think... Uh, you know, part of our work will be to update that and track it. The horizontal lines show how much water is available. If we have average pre precipitation, the green line is that average availability. And so you can see demand versus that average, we would be good until the year 2120 for water. But it is those other times that we really want to plan for. As you look lower on that graph, the bright red line represents how much water is available during prolonged drought. And if you take a look at that line versus what is being used, we're already uh, short of water. And what that means is extreme conservation measures to make sure that there's enough water for drinking water for residents in our area. When the West Dakota board saw this, that's when they said, let's do some checking into this particular question. And so they, they took a look and said, can you find out to how much uh, interest there might be in talking about this issue. And as they did that, um, they quickly realized there was a great deal of interest. And so communities, tribes, uh, water systems throughout Western South Dakota began a discussion that has brought us to where we are today. Oftentimes I'll get a question about, well, is there enough water in the Missouri River? And as you can see, the results of our initial studies puts us in the range between 50 and 100 million gallons per day. But then if you look at the average or the mean of what is available, somewhere between 21,000 and 13,000, depending where you do the measurement, thousand million gallons a day are available in the Missouri River. And unlike in many other parts of the country, we have a huge resource that is available to help us through those drought periods. A little bit more background information when South Dakota Mines looked at this question. They projected the 10,000 acre feet per year that West Dakota had available to it as its future use water permit. That project alone is a half a billion dollars. But if you went to a much larger uh, quantity, which we think we're approaching, it's closer to a $2 billion project. And again, this report's a few years old but we know what construction prices have been doing. So obviously, as we continue to move forward, we'll continue to update those prices. One of the uh, important questions 
it has to do with drought because it's a combination of demand for that water, increased population. We always want to protect against any contamination of the aquifer, but drought is perhaps one of our bigger drivers. And as of um, earlier this year, you can see by this graph that all of Western South Dakota was either in a moderate drought or severe drought. And even though we've just had recent rains and snow, it, the, the drought, which is measured over a long period of time, continues to persist. And we'll see what happens this summer. But this is in part why it's important to say we can't always count on that average precipitation. We have to take a look at what happens when, in fact, we have drought. So West Dakota said, let's proceed with working on bringing people together. And so in 2020, a number of meetings were held, outreach, and then out of that came a next steps plan. And the recommendations from there were to create a governance structure that could manage a project such as this. Um, think Lewis and Clark in eastern South Dakota or Mini Wachone or Mini Washte or Webb. Some of these big, big projects are so large that they have their own governance. The other part of the recommendation was do further technical evaluations and of course look at funding. So some updates on that have to do with each of those categories. The governance part was recommended to be a nonprofit corporation, membership to be one membership, one vote. Uh, the name that the group chose last summer as it was getting ready to incorporate was the Western Dakota Regional Water System with member dues at $500 a year. One of the items that also is being considered is how do we really reflect membership with regard to the many, many water systems that there are in western South Dakota. In the eastern part of the state where we have nice square township lines and flat areas, there are very few separate water systems. Most rural areas plug into other regional water systems. That's not quite the case here. And as we took a look at the numbers, look, you know, Pennington alone had the 146 separate water systems. And so as we move forward in talking about this, it's not just the water coming in a bulk form to Western South Dakota, but how do we effectively and efficiently manage that water when it gets here? And so uh, as we continue these discussions. This is a part of a dialogue we would wish to have with you and other counties in Western South Dakota and how we can really take a look at uh, bringing this water over in a way that doesn't create um, uh, inefficiencies and a lot of extra government entities. We have also selected at the first annual meeting of the new Western Dakota Regional Water System a board of directors. And I won't read the names there, but as you can see, we have a great diversity uh, geographically for that. Uh, up until just a few months ago, the public works director for Hill City was on the board as well. I had a chance to catch the mayor here a few moments ago. Uh, but you know, our goal is to make sure that all parts of Western uh, South Dakota are represented in this discussion. Sometimes I'll get a question, well, where's this water line going to go? And I always say it depends on who's at the table. Because if communities fail to step up and say, I want to look ahead, I want to think about where my population will be in 50 years, 75 years. If we don't know that community wants water, the design, the engineering design, in all likelihood will not bring water to that area. So we're encouraging communities, subdivisions, that sort of thing, to understand what's going on so they can make 
great decisions for the future for their areas. The technical evaluation that was completed in October of last year, again, suggested that anywhere between 50 million gallons a day and almost 100 million gallons a day will be required. We, as soon as we formed, we got onto the state water plan, uh, which sets us up for funding possibilities. But we also knew that we would need an engineering team with the experience of these large water projects. We put out a statement of interest in 21 November, request for proposal in December, did interviews in January, and then made a selection in February of this year of AE2S and its teaming members, KLJ and Black and Beach, to help that new nonprofit move this project forward. We are also in discussions with the Board of Reclam er, the Bureau of Reclamation, and we'll be working with them too as we move on. We'll need construction dollars from the federal programs that oftentimes fund these large water projects. And so the board has just authorized a letter to go to our congressional representatives asking for uh, the congressional authorization to move ahead with the studies, not to be confused with moving ahead with the project, but there's a lot of study and work that needs to go into that process. Funding, as we took a look at this initially, the idea of ARPA funds and funds for infrastructure wasn't even a twinkle in our eye. We didn't realize that there would be major investments made through the American Rescue Plan Act and other acts to provide for infrastructure funding. But because we were able to get on the state water plan right away, uh, we were able to work with the department and made an application for funding out of the $600 billion that was approved by the legislature this year. We have, as of April 13th, received $8 million to fund the studies to move us forward. We know that additional funds will be needed, but this is a fantastic jumpstart for us and very exciting. Again, these things would not have been able to happen without support of yours and many other communities' rural water systems going forward. Um, just to give you an idea, as we've had these meetings, here are all the different entities that have engaged. We know that there's others who are interested. And now that we have the funding in place, it, it says, yeah, I think this might actually be moving forward. And so we anticipate others getting involved. We've had uh, pro, uh, support uh, from Elevate, South Dakota Mines, and uh, with that help, a community innovation grant with the South Dakota Community Foundation. And in the uh, brochure that you were provided in your packet is the list of all these things that have happened in just a little over two years' time. And again, just want to say thank you for your ongoing support uh, for, for this work and look forward to continuing a dialogue and getting your continued support for these efforts going forward. Chairman. Thank you, Cheryl. Commissioner Hedgar. For me, um, when I first, I was on this committee when Cheryl first um, started this committee, and for me, this was a no-brainer for uh, South Dakota, let alone Western South Dakota. Um, if we don't capture that water in South Dakota, somebody else will. Um, and then for us, that could be some major issues. We've seen it happen in other states. So when Cheryl asked me to be on the committee when it first started, um, I love infrastructure and Miss Cheryl is a good leader. Um, she used to be a commissioner as well. So uh, I appreciate your service in, in what you're doing for this project. Um, it's a huge economic developer development for Western South Dakota. Water is a, is a huge resource and we are talking about regionalization in this area. So um, all the pieces and parts are coming together. Gary has been on this committee uh, I think the last couple of years and represented us well. But um, for me if this happens um, can you imagine what that's going to do for Western South Dakota? 
that's going to be huge for development and in every sense of the word for commercial or residential. Um, I can't say enough that when you put this forth um, and you've been working on this at first, I'm like, okay, we're just going to talk a long time and not get anything done with this. Um, but you've moved it forward and I'm, I'm very proud of what you've done with this, Cheryl. And Thank you. Uh, anything I can do to help with this as well. Um, I just think it, it, it's huge for quality and quantity of water for uh, Western South Dakota. So for me, um, it, it, it's huge. So I appreciate everything and all your work that you put into this, Ms. Cheryl. Thank you. So this was sure. very much forward thinking uh, on the part of West Dakota Water Development without realizing what was going to happen within the next few months. Um, had this not occurred, started taking place a couple of years ago, you wouldn't have been in line to be able to be at the table for the $8 million that now is a kickstart on this. So uh, I think it's the area of the Western South Dakota is very fortunate that this is on track as it is. Commissioner Roskinak. I think the people that are going to appreciate that are the folks that are going to be here 20 years from now because this is, the, this is what you're doing for them. Uh, because uh, to me, it's very aggressive. Uh, I was just curious, you got the three foot and the six foot. I assume that the six foot would be the preferred. Well, of course, that'll be part of all these studies, but we've already seen a request for about over 55,000 acre feet per year. So yes, I'm sure we're on that, on that track, more of a larger line, but that'll be part of that process. What alternatives do we have? Where should it go? You know, what reservoirs should be there? It's just a great complex question to work on and that sort of thing. And to your point too, West Dakota really did take a, a bold step. They provided that funding that was a catalyst to do the outreach, see if there was interest. And I truly believe because of the great interest that is out there, it's really been a grassroots effort which has lend, it lent itself to the progress so far to be in position to get the funding that was made available. I should mention too, there's a match for a lot of that money that the legislature appropriated. Um, ours is a 100% grant. That's so, great. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. And you, uh, Commissioner LaCroix. Well, <clears throat> Cheryl, I appreciate the hard work that you put into it. I mean, it says it on the very part of exploring the possibilities to bring uh, more water to all corners of Western South Dakota. I mean, and you're trying to communicate with other small communities, trying to gather all that information and work with all these people. That's a lot of work. A lot, I don't think a lot of people realize how much that is. And you're you're the perfect person for that. You've you've brung the people to the table, and, and that's the key the key part. So I really appreciate the hard work that you've done. Well, thank you, thank you. Any further comments? Thank you, Cheryl. Cheryl, appreciate very much bringing this report to us. Thank you thank so you. much again. Thank, thank you, you for all your work. Next item on the agenda is the. Uh, Cooperating Agency Memorandum of Understanding with the Black Hills National Forest. Uh, Commissioner Roskinek, do you want to handle this or? Well, I can certainly. You've been working on it. Certainly try. Okay. As you know that uh, Jeff uh, Tomac, Supervisor of the Black Hills National Forest, he's in the process of uh, doing, it's a revision, right, Jeff, from 2012. So uh, the count, the various counties have been uh, asked if they want to be involved with the process of working with the Forest Service with uh, building a roadmap for the next 20 years on how we want to see the Black Hills National Forest operate. So Pennington County is interested in signing this memorandum of understanding, which would make us uh, a cooperating agency going forward. And that's basically what we're doing here today. Very good. Jeff, come on forward. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Chair, uh, members of the Commission. I appreciate the time uh, on your agenda um, to provide information, additional information uh, from what uh, Commissioner Roskinect has uh, described. 
Um, I am indeed interested in working together with the counties of South Dakota and the counties in Wyoming, uh, specifically affected and or impacted um, by the management of the Black Hills National Forest. Uh, that being said, uh, I will start with uh, forest plan revision. Uh, yeah, dates uh, originally back to the current forest plan revision dates back to 1997 with amendments in 2000. 2002 and 2006. Um, we are due for uh, a revision, uh, generally under a 15 to 20 year time frame uh, for forest plan um, amendments. We will look at uh, um, doing forest plan revision under the 2012 planning rule. Uh, two particular items uh, identified in the planning rule uh, would be um, the 15 assessments, uh, recognizing existing conditions on the Black Hills National Forest, information from our communities, information from our uh, county commissioners, the latest scientific information. Uh, we'll, so we are currently working on those assessments. The other part of the 2012 planning rule that's, uh, that's of, of interest to me is cooperating agency status. Um, there is an emphasis in the 2012 planning rule for local engagement, local involvement, and local meeting uh, all communities, but specifically uh, cooperating agency status with uh, state and local governments. So I have uh, indeed, as uh, Commissioner Roskinek mentioned, I have started working with seven counties, two in Wyoming, five in South Dakota, along with the state of South Dakota and the state of Wyoming, um, and then various federal agencies uh, in specifically regarding uh, cooperating agency status. Most recently, um, uh, Another thank you to Pennington County uh, for hosting the meeting recently. Uh, see, a couple weeks ago, we had a meeting with five of the seven counties were represented uh, in the Black Hills area. So very much appreciate uh, the hosting of that meeting here in, in your boardroom. Um, good conversations about how collectively uh, commissioners, uh, counties would like to move forward with cooperating agency status. Um, I did get out of that particular meeting, or at least a sense that uh, counties will work together, uh, but at the same time have an interest in specific memorandum of understanding and or agreements with myself, uh, the Black Hills National Forest, uh, on cooperating agency status. So this is an official request for me, uh, from me, uh, to work with you. If you, uh, if you were to designate representatives from the commission, the next step for me would be to work uh, directly with those representatives. Um, and we would start with the example that I have uh, provided to Mr. Guffey. Uh, it's a template for cooperating agency status. It is by no means set in stone. Uh, it is uh, to begin the conversations with, uh, with Pennington County in this case and the commissioners and how you would like to work together cooperatively uh, on forest plan revision. We're expecting uh, this, I'd like to believe uh, that we can get through forest plan revision in a three year time frame. Uh, and you know this forest plan revision, uh, which the forest plan revision process will likely uh, take place or be initiated once we've completed the assessments and once we've had review, we'll be sending out the assessments to the communities, um, to our publics and take comment on those assessments. We'll look to officially kick off the forest plan revision process November of this uh, calendar year um, once we've completed the assessments again. And, and that will begin with a notice of intent in the Federal Register to initiate. That's technically um, when 
cooperating agency status uh, would begin, but my interest is, and in, in full disclosure, some, some commissioner's interest is to have cooperating agency status documents in place currently, or perhaps even a few months ago as we're working through the assessment. So again, if, uh, if and when, if you have interest, uh, I believe there is based on uh, discussions so far. Um, once you have designated uh, uh, representatives from, uh, from Pennington County Commissioner, uh, Pennington County, then I will, uh, I would propose we set up a meeting between the representatives, Mr. Jim Goobles, District Ranger Goobles, and myself uh, to start working through the document uh, on the specifics. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Edgar. So, Scott Guffey, if you could come up here. <laughs> Um, do you, are you represented on this committee at all, um, Scott? Thank you, uh, Scott Guffey, Pankton County uh, Natural Resource Director. Um, I was visiting with Supervisor Tomac in the hall and, and, and as we mentioned at your last meeting during the uh, committee reports, uh, Ron brought up that point, he's looking for points of contact, points of contact for the county. Uh, it was suggested that Ron and myself be those points of contact. So okay. I think that's what Jim's look, or uh, Jeff's looking for today is a, uh, a motion in that. In okay, that just making sure you were on that because just knowing your background and uh, you know everything and anything about this forest, the plants, the trees, the <clears throat> soils, um, for me that was a no-brainer to have you on there. So um, just so um, you were representative, um, we are well taken care of. That's great. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Commissioner LaCroix. Uh, Jeff, thank, thank you for coming forward and, what's, and presenting this. You know, we've had district rangers come to the county before and give us updates and, and presentations, and I think we were working on MOUs quite a while, but I think you get, it's come to the critical point where this is what we need to do. And I do believe at our last meeting, we. I don't know if we have, you know, if we approve this MOU, if we at the next meeting need to appoint, uh, put that on our agenda to, to appoint Mr. Guffey and Ron Ross connect to that or just give them the, just the point of contact. I, I think you can appoint them today and bring back the MOU for approval or review. I agree with that. I, I'd take a motion. To I'd make that motion. So I've, got, I've got a motion then to uh, appoint Commissioner Ron Rosconnect and uh, Natural Resources Director Scott Guffey uh, from Pennington County. Mr. Is Chair. There second? Is there a second? I'll second, second that. Or, second. Go ahead, Travis. I had already seconded it, so. Yep. Okay. All those in favor, or is there any public comment in regard to this? Any further discussion by the commission? Mr. Chair, I just might point out that Scott and I will have access through a portal with the U.S. Forest Service so that we can get their input, they can get our input, and uh, this is how we're going to communicate between the county and the Forest Service uh, going forward. Yeah, and Ron, we did get that. Uh, Luke Conroy with the Forest Service did give me that portal, and we got it up, and I did, did send them our, our latest uh, community development plan, so it is working, so that's good. Super. All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Scott. Jeff. One yeah. more thing, oh, yeah. if, I, if I could. Um, look forward to working with you. Appreciate this opportunity. I want to, uh, I want to emphasize, uh, you know, Ranger Goobles, uh, who has been in front of this commission uh, several times, uh, we will both uh, be in communication with you and we will both work with you uh, in regards to force plan revision. So um, anytime that you have an interest for updates, et cetera, to this body, then uh, either Jim or I are, are willing to and able to visit with you. Very good, super, appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. What do we Jim kept it kind of quiet back there today. <laughs> so we're not doing the MOU today? It was just in draft form. Draft. I suppose it needs yep. to be brought back. That works good. Good. Okay. Yep. Okay, next item we have up is uh, a lien re uh, uh, release request. 
Uh, I believe the applicant is on Zoom. Uh, the applicant's initials are CS. And uh, so I would open this up for uh, uh, Mr. CS to explain his request to us. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay. So your your um, your your request for the for the release, uh, just tell us about how it came about and uh, uh, your current status. Okay, um, I was in which I, I live in Tennessee, but I was in South Dakota in 2020 and got in trouble. I was appointed a lawyer. You know, they uh, they sentenced me to some time. I just got out. Um, in December, and then they sent me a letter. I got it sometime last month, saying that I had to pay about a, it was fifteen hundred. You know, I don't make any type of money, so I called them about it and asked, you know, is there any way to get it reduced? And they said I had to go, had to do this thing. Then they sent me another thing, and now it says I owe about three thousand for lawyer fees. And I don't have money. I don't make a lot. I have all types of other stuff. I have to pay rent, pay people to get to work because I can't get a good paying job to get money to pay it because I have a felony. It's hard to find a job. I really just have what I can get. So the amount so, that you're re requesting to be released is $2,970. And as I understand yes, what sir. you're saying is this all involves uh, uh, public defender fees, is that yeah. correct? Yes, sir. I was, able, I was able to pay the court costs and all that's just public defender fees. Okay, and you are, uh, you're not living in South Dakota at this time, are you? No, sir, I live in Tennessee. Okay, and you are employed? I am employed. I'm actually at work right now. Okay. Permission to have any questions? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Roskinek. Sir, how long have you been employed? How long have I been employed? Uh, right after I got out since Dece uh, December. Okay. So were you incarcerated in South Dakota? Yes, sir. Okay. I did an interstate compact, so as soon as I was released, I could come back. Because I've never lived in South Dakota. I just, I, I had charges up there. I was on the run up there, and I okay. had charges. I did that. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner LaCroix. Sir, I, I, I appreciate you calling in and describing your situation to us, but also... On the same sense, we have many other clients that, we, you know, we, we house the public defenders in, in mm -hmm. our uh, campus here. And I'm on the public defenders board and, and, you know, these they need the funding as much as anybody else. And you can set up payments to keep it off, you know, a uh, little bit at a time. You've, you've paid the court costs because you, you've said you've done that in order to move. So, you know, I'm not really in favor in, of uh, passing this off. I think uh, you can make payments uh, on this because it was a service that was provided. I mean, a public defender is a service and, and it takes up a lot of their time. Mm. Well, I sent a thing in saying all the other stuff I have to pay for rent. I don't have a car. I have to pay people to drive me to work every day. I don't have, I don't make much. I don't have a lot of spare money that I can spend. Chairman. Chair. Oh. Commissioner Edgar. So how small can they, they can make $5 payments, can't they? Even? Yes. Sir, so even if you do an attempt to do, they, they, we won't, prosecute or, or set liens on people. I mean, this is a lien I meant, um, collect on those liens unless they don't pay anything. Am I correct, Miss Holly? Yeah. Or Miss Kara, you guys know that? Just so that. you have at least put $5, couple dollars towards that. So 
Even if you have just a little bit to show your appreciation to the people that had served you, sir, um, that's usually what we do for people. I have a lot of people that I serve in um, some areas that I have businesses that um, if they could just pay us $5 or $10, um, even a month, it shows appreciation for the work that you you know they helped you with, um, mm -hmm. sir. So I guess at this point, um, I'm not willing also to forgive, but um, show some effort and maybe come in, you know, after a while and and show us that you've, you know, at least tried to make an attempt to um, pay back some of the money that for the services that you provided, young man. So, Mr. Chair. Uh, one second, Ron, Commissioner Laster. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, Commissioner Hancock and Commissioner LaCroix pretty much um, have stated what I would say. You know, you came here, um, you got in trouble while you are here, you utilize our services. You know, when you get in trouble somewhere, there's consequences for your actions. And I do believe that you should at least um, show that you're willing to um, pay back the consequence, consequence of your action before I could consider uh, reducing that lien. My question is, if, if he uh, pays $10 a month or $20 a month, is there interest accruing on this, no. uh, the balance? No. no interest. So did you understand that? There's no interest. So in good faith, if you can do $20 a month, $10 a month, uh, nobody's going to come after you. I mean, and you're showing good faith that you're trying to uh, retire some debt service relative to something that happened in South Dakota. So I, I think that's the compromise that you're seeing here is that you don't have to come up with $2,970 today, tomorrow, but just a, a token of good faith, send a check in for 10 to $20 a month or whatever you feel that you can afford. Okay. Is there a motion? I'd move to deny. So I've got a motion to deny the lien uh, release, release request. The amount of $2,970. Just a comment. Uh, is there a second? Second. And a second. Further discussion? Comment, Mr. Chair. Pardon? I just want to make a comment. Okay. Uh, sir, you know, from past experience, you know, a lot of things can change in five years. You know, if you come up with a plan to get your life turned around and make small incremental payments, you know, things can change and and I think you can get to a good place to where maybe we could square it up. Any public comment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next item we have is um, item 17, request to purchase tax deed property ID Number 65319, uh, request is from uh, Austin and Mackenzie Renke. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Hadgar. Move to declare surprise tax deed property 6531 for the purpose of sale BI. What's the process we always use, Holly, please? The, uh, uh, she already has uh, contacted uh, three people that were willing to serve. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for typically that. the board uses the sealed, sealed bid, bid process. I so just I'll thought, take, sorry. <laughs> but I'll take your motion first to declare it surplus. Is there a second to that? Thank you. And a second. Uh, any public comment? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Now, need a motion to appoint individuals. Mr. Chair, I move to appoint Charlie Johnson, Michael Lewis, and Laura Wagner as the three real property owners pursuant to South Dakota Codified Laws 613-2 who will complete and file an appraisal report for the, the tax deed property. Is there a second? Second. Any public comment? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, item 18, items from the auditor. Good morning. Good morning. Casey Iceland, Chief Deputy Auditor. Um, today I'm looking for an approval on a new retail on sale liquor license with Sunday sales for Diamond Spur Events LLC under Alicia Edson. Mr. Chair, 
Commissioner Roskinek. I'll move to approve a new retail on sale liquor license with Sunday sales for Diamond Spur Event Center LLC. Sorry. Second. Second. I've got a motion and a second. Uh, any public comment? Any further discussion by the commission? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Okay. Item 19. Items from buildings and grounds. Am I cool? Good morning. Uh, Mike Cool, Director of Pendy County Buildings and Grounds. Uh, at your last meeting, I brought uh, to you to introduce the uh, building committee's recommendation for uh, uh, a remodel of the state's attorney's office to meet some uh, uh, of their uh, growth needs. Uh, bless you. Thank you. Uh, I am bringing the, returning this for a second. As a, as a building recommendation, two meetings are required for it. I'm bringing it back to you again here for uh, uh, authorization. I'm seeking uh, $210,000 authorization for $210,000 to begin working on these uh, remodel you. elements to address these problems. Mr. Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. Moved to authorize my cool director of buildings and grounds to uh, have spending authority for the community. Accumulate building funds up to 210000 to execute renovations on the state's attorney's office. Is there a second? Second. And a second. And a follow Public up. comment. Follow up when you're done, Chip. Commissioner Adcock. Um, for me, I, I thought it could be done maybe a little bit differently than this, but uh, I was wrong. I'm okay. okay with that. I figured we could be more innovative, maybe do some stuff where um, we're having people work at home, things like that. But these are areas, if you look, um, cubicle areas, um, storage units to meeting rooms. I mean, they're being very innovative with what they're trying to do uh, for their people up in uh, in the state's attorney's office. So at this time, just watching on, on the things that they need to do um, for removal of rolling storage, um, walls and office to open for workstations. Um, that's that's pretty common. So um, I appreciate the work you've done on this, Mike, and that uh, for me, um, it's something that needs to be done and the way you're doing it and how you're using some in-house too to get some of this done, Mike. Um, I appreciate your service and um, something well needed for them as well, so. Any further Thank discussion? You. All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Item 20, Highway Department. Good morning, Commission. Joe Miller, Pennington County Highway Department. Uh, first item, uh, item A, is our county striping agreement with the state of South Dakota. Um, just some tidbits here. Uh, this, states had this program for approximately 15 years. Um, the county's been participating in it for approximately that long as well. Our county policy is that we stripe anything that has a speed limit over 35 miles an hour. Um, this funding, as they always say, isn't guaranteed going into the future, but it is for this year. Basically, the state puts up a half million dollars for all of the counties with paved roads to, to apply for and dip into, and it's a proportionate uh, with the amount of paved roads to those counties. Um, there is a portion of it that was last year and again this year was um, a new high build type paint. It's a, supposed to be a longer lasting paint, supposed to last up to five years instead of the year or two that we get out of the normal paint. Um, last year they had uh, sourcing issues so they weren't able to do it. Um, and then so this year they're going to try and do that again uh, with that. Um, the ADT is what kind of dictates what gets that high build paint and it's anything over 500 uh, average daily traffic count um, and your chip seal schedule because they don't want it chip sealed for, you know, once they put it down, they don't want it chip sealed over the next year because it is a more expensive paint. So, Chairman. Commissioner Hadcock. Just a question for Joe. So, mag water, salt, that's probably not helping any of the paint you put on the, the highways or the streets even in Rapid City, um, do they make anything that actually isn't so, um, doesn't take the paint off as quick because of that? Because I'm gonna guess that's probably your number one reason why it doesn't last. 
Well, I don't know that that's the, the number one reason. Um, it's probably a contributing factor. Um, but when you drag a snowplow over something, it's going, it's just like sandpaper. So it's eventually going to wear off. That's true. Um, so that's I think true. that's the, the biggest factor is, is plowing the snow and even the, the traffic, the tire traffic, you know, it's, it's scrubbing it off every, every time it goes over that. So, so how many times, uh, do we do it every two years? Do we do it every year? Typically do it every year. Okay. Just that's, I didn't know we did it every year. So how many miles of road do we stripe every year? Do you know? You would ask me that, and I don't have the answer for you right now. Um, if I had to guess, it's probably about 200 or so. Miles? Correct. Well, okay. Thank you, I don't Duke. remember what's exactly in the agreement, but it's it should be somewhere around there. But I can get you a number after the meeting here. Um, the cost of the, the last couple of years here to the county, uh, so 2019, the cost of the county was $258,000. Um, 2020 was $244,000, 2021 was $294,000, and then this year's cost will be $383,000. Oh. Um, so, so a lot of that's uh, our sheer miles, but uh, you know, last year to this year is the same number of miles, and it's about $90,000 more. So that's your, uh, that's your inflation at its finest right there. So, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Lacroix. Move to approve the agreement with South Dakota Department of Transportation <laughs> for the 2022 County Striping Project P000S0234 PCN 07 DQ and PHOS 420 PCN 07 WX. Got a motion and a second. Is there any public comment? Any further discussion by the commission? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Next up, item B, uh, professional services for data collection uh, for payment, 2022 payment condition index. Um, so in February, March, our department began putting together a request for proposal on payment condition index or putting basically a, a payment condition index is uh, something that our department has been doing for several years, but it's something that we've been doing with our engineering department. And they go out and they look at the roads, they look at the cracking, the rutting, the, basically the condition of the pavement, um, you know, and one person's interpretation is different than the next. So uh, we began looking for something. And I think we learned about this last year at our, our conference in Deadwood. Um, the city's doing this this year, and I think they've done it a couple times in the past. There's other counties around the state, Minnehaha being one of them, and there's a couple others that uh, have done this um, same procedure, basically. And what it does is it uh, objectifies what we're actually, our engineering department is looking at um, with aut automatic technology. Um, the, this company has vans that are outfitted with laser tech or uh, LIDAR and, and different capabilities to look at the, the, the road surface and, and determine some of the things that before we were doing with our visual inspections. So um, with what this uh, roadway asset services is going to put together will also assist us in, in budgetary numbers for the years to come. Um, so the, their suggestion is to do this every three to five years, um, just depending on, on your your cycles, your freeze thaw cycles, uh, traffic counts, all that, all that kind of take, goes into effect, or goes into that decision making. But we feel that roadway asset services paired with Ferber Engineering, who we have a really great relationship with, um, will be the best company to provide this service, um, and we think it'll be valuable for the county to objectify our decision making and, and put together some budgetary numbers for the years to come. With that, I'll stand for any questions. Mr. Go ahead, Ron. Commissioner Edgar. So you rate the roads, and we've done this before? We have not done this exact procedure before. We, we do it on a visual-based inspection. Our engineering services goes out, and they drive the roads. So you can imagine driving at 15, 20 mile an hour, you're going to, you're going to catch the really bad defects, but you're going to miss the, the minor stuff. Um, For the public, how much road are they inspecting? 364 miles, or yeah, 364 miles. Yes, sir. So... Um, I think this is a good process. I think it rates the roads. It also puts, like you said, you put your priorities based on some of these areas that um, need uh, repairing. Um, for me, um, I think that's huge, and I think it's for your, your benefit of um, what you guys do. So 
um, when you can see and put a put a um, data on something that you know is a no-brainer for um, what areas that you have to do first, make your plans accordingly. Some sometimes because of water or flooding or different areas um, might have to come to the to the front of that line for budgets, but um, I think it's going to be huge for setting your budgets. And like you do the bridges, you have inspections on those bridges, and that's how you set your budget. So, um, Joe, this is pretty innovative of what's coming next on roads. So I appreciate that. Infrastructure and our roads in Pennington County are huge for our uh, constituents. So thank you. Yep, sure. If I may, with uh, with what Deb was saying, um, you know, you don't, they always say you don't want to chase, you don't want to do your worst first because then you'll never catch up. So um, what this will allow us to do is put a, a rating and figure out where we want that good, fair, and excellent condition and let those ones that are in poor condition, you know, that we, we'd ultimately spend a bunch of money fixing up and let the ones that are in good and fair condition fall behind. So we'd be able to keep our ones that are in good and fair condition in those good and fair and then work on getting the rest of them up to to a good standard. So, Thanks, uh, Joe, have you... Uh, visited with other counties that have used this process and and uh, seen any reports uh, relative to other counties doing this uh, process? We visited very briefly with Minnehaha, but didn't get into a whole lot of detail. They, you know, they've been doing it for quite a while. It seems like um, our project manager Josh did visit with the city. Um, they actually chose to go with a different company, and there's they're in the process of starting theirs. Um, right now, they're just in the, the preliminary phases. They haven't got any boots on the ground yet, I don't believe. So um, not necessarily in-depth. I have not spoke with any other communities. So if we go this route, are there any particular roads that would have priority over others? I don't know until this is finished. Um, they're doing all of the paved roads, so there's no <coughs> priority over on, on any of those roads currently. We'll take a look at all of them, and ultimately they'll give us their recommendation on what they think their priority is based on the pavement condition index that they give us. Thank you. Commissioner LaCroix. <coughs> you can go ahead and then I'll go after okay. you. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. I like this idea because, you know, for as many years as we've been doing this, we, we constantly get uh, concerns over road conditions by different residents and we have to explain to them, you know, there's a, others out there that are worse than yours. You know, we're creatures that have it. We drive the same place every day, same store, same place to work. So we only know the roads that are that we're using in our area. And this this is more uh, engineered and with tech uh, with the tech uh, technology that it's going to tell us what the road condition is. So we know where our priorities, so we can make a good. Uh, decision as commissioners and and as for your department, but not only that, but also to the residents that are out there. You know, I mean, it, we can show them the information and so what kind of condition our roads are. But this is some new, some new te technology. I see it's like one hundred forty-five thousand dollars to do this. Is that how much this is? The the proposal. So that was American Engineering testing. That was the high proposal. Highest. This one was actually the low proposal, but we're proposing putting the options into it. So the total cost is about one hundred and two, eight hundred and seven. I think is what the total cost was. So one hundred and two. One hundred two thousand eight hundred and seven. I think is. Okay. But I just wanted to bring that up. I mean, it, it seems like a lot, but really the the, the information that you're getting. And the data that you're going to get guides you for the next five years at least. Correct. And, and I mean, to put that in perspective, I think our county highway system in, as a whole is, and if, I, if I recall correctly, it's valued at like $40 million yeah. or something like that. It's astronomical what it's valued at. So this is a very small portion of that to keep that stuff in good condition. Yeah. Oh, last year. Joe, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this question. Is there a way to do this for gravel roads, too? <laughs> I'm sure you were expecting that one to come along since I've got a lot of them out. In a... Well, it, it was my exact question, and I think the answer is yes, but we're starting with our pavement. Of um, course. And then we will we'll, we'll dive into that, but that was one of the questions I asked as well. So Fair enough. Um, it's, uh, the question is, how do you objectify it? Because gravel roads are constantly changing. Um, by the day, so you what do you, what are you going to look at, right? Because what you look at 
you know, next week when we have some moisture and we've had a chance to be out there and maintain it, or when you look at it at the end of August when we haven't had rain for a month and a half, you're going to get two different things. So that's kind of the, the tough part. So um, once we get this one under our belt, I think we can dive into that and figure out exactly where we might go f with that. Fair enough. Thanks. Is there a motion? What's, what's that amount? You said 102,000. 102,807. 807. I'd make that motion uh, for the debt to request to authorize Highway Department to enter into a contract with what's the name of that company? Or, uh, Roadway Asset Systems. For data collection for the 2022 pavement, pavement condition index and a note to not to exceed. One hundred and two thousand and eight hundred and seven dollars. There a second. Second. Got a motion and second. Uh, is there any public comment in regard to this? Seeing none, back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item C. Item C, and if I may answer Deb's question from item A here, Sean just texted me and um, we striped 284 miles Thank you. total. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Item C, our equipment purchase plan. Um, so many of you, I think everybody except for possibly Travis has seen this before. Um, <laughs> so when I first started um, in 2018, um, we have a plan for our roads. We have a plan for pretty much everything, but we didn't have a plan for um, our replacing our equipment and keeping our equipment up to date. Um, so our office worked and, and put together a replacement plan um, that was voted on and approved by the board in 2019. Um, since then, uh, with our scheduled DOT inspections, our plan has had to change a little bit. Um, so with that and the increasing, or excuse me, the rising cost of equipment, um, we're seeking approval to update this plan um, for the next 10 years. Chairman. Commissioner Adcock. Move to approve Highway Department 10-year equipment purchase plan from 2023 to 2033. Is there a second? Second. Got a motion and a second. Any public comment? Any further discussion by the commission? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item D. So item D, I believe this request came to you a couple meetings ago to present. New Jones messing with me over there. Um, <laughs> purchase of a new brush chipper. Um, so basically, our we have one. Oh, let me start here. Um, we have one brush chipper that is based out of the Rapid City office. Um, prior years, since 2013, our Hill City division has actually been using uh, brush piles or piles that were started due to the storm, winter storm atlas um, to stockpile their brush on and that is no longer um, a viable option. So we pursued the purchase of a, of a brush chipper from Vermeer. Uh, they did locate one that they can, they think they can get it to us by October um, in the amount of $49,167.92. Um, with that, I'll stand for any questions. Any questions? Chair. Commissioner. Move, move to authorize Highway Department to purchase the 2022 Vermeer the X 1000 XL breast chipper for Premier High Plains Box Elder South Dakota in the amount of $49,167.92 under the source well contract 03 1721 BRM. There a second. Thank you. Any public comment on this? Seeing none, back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item E. Item E, uh, preservation projects. Um, we're seeking authorization to advertise and let the big preservation projects. So that's our rehabilitation. We've got two on uh, 161 right there in New Underwood, uh, another one on Neck Yoke. Where's the other one, Sean? Uh, I don't recall where the other one was. Um, but uh, we've got uh, our last 404 permit from the uh, Corps of Engineers. We just got that here. Uh, this morning. Um, so we're hoping for approval from the state here this week yet. Um, with that, I'll stand for any questions. Any questions, Joe? Is there a motion? Mr. Chair. 
Commissioner Lasker. Move to authorize the highway department to advertise and let bids for the bridge improvement grant presentation work for bridges 52-395-367, 52-472-420, 52-608-295, and 52-608-298. Second. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any public comment in regard to these? Back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Appreciate it. Now's the time for uh, hear from items from the public. I have Roger Thompson that is uh, listed. He would like to uh, address us. And this is a time for uh, any uh, members of the public to address issues that are not uh, a part of the uh, agenda. So information can be received, but no action will be taken. Welcome, Mr. Thompson. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to come and speak to you this morning about a concern of mine um, thank you. that involves the integrity of the um, elections in South Dakota. And what keyed my interest um, was a firestorm that's currently happening um, in Colorado. Briefly, what's happened there is after a municipal election in Mesa County, the um, Tina Peters, who is the county clerk, um, according to Colorado law and federal law, um, made an image of the um, election results before the Secretary of State in Colorado did uh, what they called a trusted build. So she had the original image of the election results. After the trusted build happened, um, Tina Peters made another image of the servers and found that the um, the trusted build had erased all the election data, not just for the, the municipal election there, but also for the 2020 election. And that's created a huge firestorm. Um, in Arizona, there's currently a, um, oh, I forget what they call it. It's a, anyway, it's, um, a legal action in Colorado to stop the use of all voting machine, or in Arizona, to stop the use of all voting machines there because of forensic audits that have been done on these machines. So that kind of got me curious. And so I started looking at the procedures used in South Dakota. And um, comes to find out that um, we're using ballot boxes. I think there's only one in Pennington County. I think that's just outside the auditor's office. But I think there were several in Minnehaha and Lincoln counties. And here recently, because of a Freedom of Information request by a group over on the east side, they've stopped the use of all drop boxes in Lincoln and Minnehaha County. As far as the rest of the state is concerned, I don't know where the drop boxes are or if there are any in any of the other counties. So far, I've tried to talk to the Secretary of State. Um, basically, they slammed the door in my face because of my concerns. I've talked to the auditor. She told me that in Pennington County, and she told me there's nothing that she could do. And consequently, I'm here now. So the forensic audit that was conducted in Colorado involved 
Dominion voting machines, which we do not use in South Dakota. We use machines from um, elect let's see, electronic um, ES and S anyway, whatever the, that stands for. And we use the M100s, the 150s, uh, I think the 450s and the 650 um, optical scanners along with tabulators. And I've been told in everybody that I've talked to said that these machines are not connected to the internet and uh, they're all air gapped. And that's pretty much the ESNS party line. I noticed that you each have laptops up there. Are they connected to the internet at all? Yes. Mine's, mine's not. They're not connected to the internet? Do they have ethernet cables hooked up to them? All it takes, see if I've got a little, all it takes for these computers to have access to the internet is this little device right here. If you have an optical mouse, this is all it takes. This is a Wi-Fi receiver. As far as I understand how the system works, we use paper ballots. Those paper ballots are optically scanned. The scanning results go into the tabulators in a central facility, and therefore, um, these, I think it's the 550s and the 650s, all they are basically are computers. And these computers can be um, accessed by this little device right here. Now if these, the certification process, I looked at that in the state site, and um, basically what the certification process of our machines in South Dakota involves, they prepared like 500 ballots and ran them through the various machines and had tabulated from the beginning to the end and they all checked out okay. But there was no attempt to make um, any determination of the firmware and what the firmware in these machines consists of, nor how the software that governs these machines um, were done and how the software was configured. As far as the firmware, these machines are built overseas some some parts and everything in the components are um, prepared or manufactured in China, in Mexico. They assemble some of them in various countries throughout the world. Now, what happened in South Dakota? If you look at that handout that I gave you, the first couple of sheets are depicting what they call P caps. Those are packet captures. Those are electronic transmissions from an attacking source to the uh, target source. Then if you go down two pages, it gives you the origination via uh, latitude, longitude of the attacker and the following pages indicate um, the, um, let's see, I think it was the province or the, um, the jurisdiction in the, in the attacking country, the province, for example, in China. And then on the US side of it, I think on the last or the third or fourth sheet down there, it says, <clears throat> where the target was. And those, the last sheet there that tells you about the targets were basically the five or six battleground states that the attackers tried to uh, manipulate the votes on. So in South Dakota, on the last 
sheet there. It shows you uh, what happened in South Dakota and what IP addresses were affected there. If you notice way over on the right hand side, the highlighted areas are the number of votes that were changed um, in every county in South Dakota. And I think in, in Pennington County, there were like 4,962 votes that were flipped. And you can see by the rest of the um, indications there what happened in South Dakota. Chairman. Commissioner Hedgott. Can I ask what you do for a living, sir? Pardon me? What do you do for a living? I'm retired. What'd you do before then? Pardon me? What'd you do before you retired, sir? Oh, I was in the Air Force. Yeah. I figured you're military because a lot of this I'm not understanding, not because you're in the military, but <laughs> because I am not. I'm computer. sorry about that. If there's oh. any misunderstanding, I'd be more than happy. No. no. So as far as the certification is concerned in South Dakota, the real telling point for me was all they did was run the ballots um, through the machines and then um, supposedly everything came out okay, the numbers tallied and everything. And lo and behold, I come to find out that who was responsible for the certification of these machines? I think it was Manganero, something like this who is a representative from ESNS, the machine manufacturer. And according to, I think, federal law, at least this is what ENS, ESNS is um, basing their reluctance to allow any outside um, interest to look inside their machines as some kind of a proprietary law or something like this. So we don't know really what's going on inside these machines, particularly with how the firmware is configured and how the software is configured. So in my estimation, the use of these machines leaves South Dakota voters kind of at a quandary. Do they trust the election or not? And I can't seem to get any um, any, any enthusiastic uh, interest in what I've been able to discover here? Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Roskin. So I did reach out to Cindy, our auditor, and I asked her about the paper ballot box or the boxes, and she indicated there was one in Pennington County, or, and that was in the county administration building. Yeah. Then I asked her about uh, using uh, the Dominion or their submachine and indicated that we do not use electronic machines but uh, everything's paper ballots but there is a machine that they use to scan the paper ballots if, mm -hmm. if i understand that right that's so, the optical scanner but uh first i heard the day is is that could be manipulated but if it's not connected to the internet that kind of gave me a comfort level i guess to me maybe you should be reaching out to somebody on the state level, and I appreciate the awareness uh, to the county, for sure. Yeah, you know, um, the main thing for me is, in doing my research, and I've been looking at this for probably good night for over a, for over a year, and I've looked at um, analysis reports done by Oh, well, there's one done by the University of Pennsylvania um, on an electronic voting systems, another one by MIT, another one by Johns Hopkins, and every single one of them point out numerous fallacies and difficulties in the firmware and the software and how the software is configured. And here we've got an election coming up here before too long or at least a primary election anyway, on the 7th of June, I believe. And I guess the only solution is to go to paper ballots and hand counting. So, Mr. Thompson, 
I'm not, I'm not sure this commission can do anything that you would like to see done, but our election officials are in the room. Uh, they've heard what you've had to say. Uh, I would ask that they carry your message on to the state. I, I believe that conversation is, has been held, <clears throat> but I would ask them to do that. Uh, you indicated you couldn't get through the door at the Secretary of State's no, office. could not, no. And so I, I suspect that uh, as they're going through the process of uh, election schooling and so forth, they will have that opportunity to ask and request information on it. Mm -hmm. So we'll carry it from, we'll carry it on from here, uh, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be able to resolve the questions that you have either. No, I think the only the only solution um, to the questions and everything, and to reinforce the public's concern over the integrity of the elections, is to have an independent source. Um, be able to come in and authorize by the state to look at each and every electronic machine that we have, to be able to examine the firmware in there, to find out what kind of components are there, and also someone with sophistication enough to be able to determine what the software in there is and how it's configured. So, Chairman. So. I think in elections, there's a lot to do with honesty and integrity, whether it's um, through computers or, or through paper ballots. I think if you want to manipulate something, um, I think people will. If they want to be honest or have integrity, whether it be a paper ballot for me or electronically, I'm list and I am listed to you, yeah. I, I think they can do it either way. I think that can be... What I've learned and I've been in politics for a while, um, people are either going to be honest and have integrity, and I, I truly believe our auditor and their team have been with us for a while. Um, the last one, even Miss Julie. So I, I'm listening to your computer stuff, and yeah, I don't understand all of it, but your bottom line is is the manipulation of what the, what the outcome is, sir. So again, I'm finding again, whether it be paper, uh, computer, or otherwise, it's going to be the person with integrity and honesty that is running that department, whether it be a hundred people in your town or four million. So, yeah, and I don't mean to point the finger at anybody, but it sounds the impression that I've gotten in talking with people at the Secretary of State and so on that essentially they are just following what the representatives from the um, machine manufacturers are telling them what's in the machine. And it's easy to find um, information on the internet about all the various roadblocks and everything that ES&S has put up to any kind of investigation into the design of their equipment and also the software that they use under the guise of it's proprietary. But anytime you have a um, private corporation like ES&S work that's under contract to um, an agency like the, the government of South Dakota, those proprietary rules do not apply. They're on their contract, and they need to be open and above board. But that's the tactic that they've been using. So, Mr. Oh, Chairman. Lori, <clears throat> do we use any electronic voting in Bennington County? Yes. There's no electronic voting. Everything is... Okay. Uh, that's... Yeah. The DS850 tabulator counter is not connected to the Internet. Um, there is no one, the only people that are even in the counting center is staff, so there's no one in close prom, prom, closeness to the tabulator to even have any device which may or may not be a hacking device. Um, then I have there, a... there are checks and balances built into every step of elections. 
the uh, first one being a test stack. So we get a test stack of, that is created that tests every oval on the ballot, every candidate on the ballot, testing blank ballots over and unders. So we have a spreadsheet of exactly what the count would be and the ballots that are run through that we match to the spreadsheet. So we know that the tabulators are counting um, the ballots correctly. That test deck is done several times before an election, once open to the public. There's um, checks and balances at the polling place where a poll worker signs a list that's matched to a voter registration list. Um, those numbers are added up and presented with the ballots. So when the ballots go through the tabulator, they know exactly how many ballots are there. Ovals already have been tested. Um, and again, another check and balance is at the canvas where you're presented with the results and the poll list. So you know this precinct had this many ballots. You can see that many people signed the poll list. So there's several checks and balances built in to prevent any type of fraud that we have done for years. So, Mr. Thompson, Lori Severson is in charge of elections for Pennington County under the auditor's office. And I would suggest that if you do have anything further you would like to uh, bring up that you might try to Make time Cindy with has Lori. been in conversation oh, you've already many, had the conversation. many times. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Laster. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the, or do you have any questions? Yes, sir. Actually, uh, and, and Lori, just, uh, I was going to, one, I was going to ask if Cindy's got his contact information, because you, but you just said that they've had a lot of conversations. And, and I say that because uh, I've been talking to Cindy on this issue. There's been a lot of information that's been presented to me uh, on this stuff as well. And I've gone and had in-depth in and thorough conversations with them on that. What, what I have problems trying to verify is the information that's been given to me. And so I, I would gladly sit down with you and the information you got here, I'm actually doing some searches on the uh, latitude and longitudes to see where the attack happened and none of those are matching up with our building. Yeah. And, and that's just a preliminary. But I, I'm interested in this kind of stuff. I do a lot of research on this kind of stuff to, to verify one way or the other. Um, and maybe I'll just reach out to Sydney. We'll have that conversation. Good, I'll take advantage of that for sure. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Very thank good. you, Mr. Thompson. Well, thank you very much for your time. You bet. Next item is uh, item 22. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, move to take a 10 minute break. 10 uh, minute break? Okay. I've got a okay. motion for a 10 minute break. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Ten minutes. And to go into the Board of Adjustment. So moved. Got a motion. Got it. Is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Morning, Commissioners. Madison Ransom, Environmental Planner. Agenda item A is a variance, VA 22-06, to allow an existing detached accessory structure with living quarters located in the front yard to be used as a bed and breakfast on the subject property. The applicant is Lana Paulson. She is in the audience and can answer any questions. The location is 3920 Moon Meadows Road. The size of the property is 40.35 acres. It is currently zoned suburban residential district and there's no special flood hazard on the property. When determining a recommendation for variances, staff takes a two-prong approach. They are on the screen and I will read the findings. Prong one, whether granting the variance runs counter to the public interest. Number one, no, the request does not appear to be a threat or nuisance to the neighborhood. Number two, no, detached garage in the front yard are present in this area, but, not, but are not being used as bed and breakfast with living quarters. Number three, no, the zoning ordinance does not allow detached bed and breakfast buildings to be located in any front yard. Four is not applicable. Five, no, placement of the garage within the front yard does not appear to harm the public or community. Prong two, whether special conditions exist to grant a variance. Number one, no, the applicant has the space to build a detached bed and breakfast that will allow it to not be located in the front yard. 
property history, there is a single family residence with an attached garage, a garage with finished space, a pole barn, and a detached garage. This property is within the city um, three mile plotting jurisdiction and the Rapid City one mile septic jurisdiction. The request was routed for interdepartmental review. City of Rapid City commented, Dunsmore Road, Sheridan Lake Road, and Moon Meadows Drive are all classified as principal arterials within the city's major street plan, requiring a minimum right of, way, um, right of way width of 100 feet, ensure proper setbacks will be met, and the future land use plan identifies that property as a mixed use commercial adjacent to a community activity center. No other comments or concerns were received. Analysis, January 21st, 2022, staff received a complaint and a violation was opened on the property regarding a vacation home rental without a conditional use permit. The applicant mailed in a conditional use permit request and staff found that the requested use did not meet the zoning ordinance as a vacation home rental because the property was not being rented out in its entirety. February 28th, 2022, staff met with the applicants to discuss possible options. April 21st, 2022, staff performed a site visit and found the permitted single family residence, garage with living quarters, a barn on the property. In an unpermitted garage, the applicant has applied for a building permit for the unpermitted garage and paid the penalty fee. Staff recommends, therefore, staff recommends denial. There are no special conditions that exist to grant this variance request, as the applicant has had the option to build a structure elsewhere on the property that would not be located in the front yard. Questions? Uh, just a comment, Mr. Chair. So note eight, it says the intent of the ordinance is to keep bed and breakfast structures out of the front yard of properties. This particular property is 40 acres. There's three sides <coughs> bordered by paved roads. You got Sharon Lake Road, Dunsmore, and Moon Meadows. So I guess you could, which one's the front yard? I mean, I don't have a problem with this particular request just because of the nature and the topographic features of the 40 acre parcel. Is uh, are the Paulsons here? Yes. yes. Sure. Come on up. I'm Lana Paulson. Okay. Tell us. Okay, so you have the the 40 acre parcel. Yep. As Commissioner Ross Connect just said, it's actually bordered by asphalt roads on three sides. Correct. Your driveway comes off Moon Meadows. Yeah. Okay. So, and you have a, you just, just describe to us what you have there as far as you have the, the first building, which is at least a, it's a multi-car garage, I know. Yeah. Plus. Yeah. It's just a shop. Um, my husband works from home. He works remotely. So he works out of there. And then we have the attached um, living quarters. When we actually, when we first moved here um, during 2020, um, we I li actually lived in my parents' basement for 10 months because we wanted to find a place that um, suited our needs. We, I knew moving back that I would, um, I have four kids, I'm a stay-at-home mom, but I really wanted something that was kind of an outlet for me personally just to have. Um, and so doing something with, finding a house with the guest quarters was really important to us. So that was actually why we bought the property. Um, and then we found out that you know we couldn't do it but um we're trying to figure out a way to make it work that is like conforms for the county and also for us yeah, I mean. okay. commissioner Erica. so did you guys build the garage or did you inherit that garage we inherited right everything yeah okay. yeah and there's <laughs> been a lot of surprises along the way well that that makes the difference as well is that you're not trying to get away with anything with this you're just thought it was a good idea we are for me, this is um, 40 acres. Um, we usually go by policy and procedure, but we are working on accessory dwellings. We are also looking for living spaces for people in uh, Rapid City right now. So there's different circumstances as well. So for me, um, personally, I don't, I don't have a problem with that, um, what you're doing at this time. I don't know how we bring it up to code or if we can, Brittany, or make it. Um, is it just that we say, well, they can do this, or how do we make it so they can? Um, Build the permit. 
just like they, they inherited a garage. We don't want somebody, if they decide to sell later, to inherit this and, and have to come in again and say, okay, um, you're not following the rules and regs. Their neighbors told on them or something like that. So how do we make it accept? Okay, I'll be quiet for a second. Go ahead. Just trying to sure. Help. So there is a, quite a bit of history with this property. Um, the living quarters weren't necessarily supposed to be living quarters, and there was supposed to be a studio. Um, it was it's full blown living quarters. So there's a, there's some history to it. Um, they are working at bringing it into compliance. Uh, a way to bring it into compliance with our ordinance was to allow it to be a bed and breakfast. However, a bed and breakfast structure could not be in a front yard. Okay. So that's where they are right now is asking for the variance to have that bed and breakfast structure in the front yard. So if we give them the variance, it's to a bed and breakfast to have some A in the front. A right, because they're part. going to utilize it as a short-term rental as a bed and breakfast, um, that structure. Yes. Okay. Thank All you right. for clarifying You're that welcome. For me. <laughs> Just making sure that, like I said, for compliance for future use that, uh, like if they sell the property or anything else, that there was a variance or something done. So, sure. um, ma'am, I don't, you're good for me, so that's my personal opinion. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner LaCroix. You know, this was the prime example of what I just talked about when we formed the, the vacation rental uh, committee that was earlier today. I don't know if you were here for that, but from my understanding is, is you're doing the building permit, you're paying the fees, you're mm -hmm. doing, getting this all up to snuff to what it needs to be. <clears throat> but the prime example is, of, of this is 40 acres and she's wanting to, to, to do a vacation rental nightly which you can block it off to have nobody there when you want privacy and you can do it when you want people to be there. Yeah. Because it gives you something to do is this, and you're on the property. Yeah, yeah. So it just makes more sense to me, as Ron said, with this. But this is the type of stuff that we're going to, I think that vacation rental uh, <clears throat> committee is going to work on because mm -hmm. I, I tell you, folks, that a lot of this is going to come to fruitation all over the place to help uh, make these payments on these properties. Yeah, yeah, so. and my parents, um, we lived in their basement for 10 months when we moved here, and then they moved into our guest house for 10 months. You know, so it's like, I'm, it's it's not necessarily gonna be that all the time. Like if a family member needs a place to live, they'll take priority, but having the option, you know, is necessary. And like I said, a lot of people don't understand, you can block it out. If you don't want nobody yeah. there, you yeah. block it out. and. From October to, to March, mm -hmm. April, May, you know, it's usually hardly anything. So uh, I I think you're you're doing the right thing now. So. Jeremy. Commissioner Edgar. I have a motion to yeah. approve um, that this is ex this variance is accepted based on uh, special conditions that they inherited the property. Um, and that it observes the spirit while doing substantial justice for this variance. Second. We got a motion and a second. Any public comment? Back to the commission. Further discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor of the uh, motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Move to come out of his uh, Got a motion to come out of. Second. And a second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. <clears throat> Filing planning and zoning matters in our uncontested hearings are those which the planning department has not yet received or provided comment contesting the item. Documents for each item have been reviewed by the commissioners and decisions during these hearings will be made based on the information provided in the packet and the short presentation. If we receive comment contesting the item, the matter will be addressed in the same manner as a contested hearing. Item B. Good morning, Commissioners. Brittany Molliner, Planning Director. Item B is public hearing of Comprehensive Plan Amendment CA 22-06. For Bruce or Sandra Rampelberg, KTM Design Solutions is the agent to amend the Comprehensive Plan to change the future land use from Agriculture District to Ranchette District. The Planning Commission did recommend approval of this Comprehensive Plan. Uh, the property consists of 18.52 acres. Uh, this request um, is in order to allow them to <clears throat> subdivide this property into two lots. Uh, this has been in front of you before. Uh, they originally requested to rezone this down to rural residential, which was denied without prejudice. So they did bring this back um, to rezone this to ranchette zoning. 
So again, staff is recommending approval and planning commission did recommend approval. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Edgar. I move to um, approve based on staff recommendation. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any public input on this? Seeing none, back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor of uh, making the change to the comprehensive plan? Uh, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> motion carried. Rezone. Item C is public hearing of Rezone RZ22-06 for Bruce or Sandra Rampelberg. KTM Design Solutions is the agent to rezone 18.52 acres from Agriculture District to Ranch Act District. The Planning Commission did recommend approval of Rezone RZ22-06. Again, this consists of 18.52 acres. It's located at 13949 <coughs> Neck Yoke Road. And with this rezone going to Ranch Act District, it will be um, in consistent with the comprehensive plan uh, with the previous approval. Chairman. Commissioner Adcock. Moved uh, approval based on or because of staff recommendations. Second. We got a motion and a second to approve the rezone. Uh, any public input? <clears throat> Further comment by the commission? All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item D. Morning, Commissioners. Jason Thennison, Deputy Planning Director. Agenda item D is Comprehensive Plan Amendment 22-08 to amend the comprehensive plan to change future land use from suburban residential district to commercial district. The applicant is Ron Weifenbach. His agent is KTM Design Solutions. Property is located approximately 0.38 miles southeast of the intersection of East Highway 44 and Reservoir Road. It is 2.6 acres, currently zoned agriculture district. Existing land use is residential. Access is off East Highway 44, and there's no special flood hazard area on the property. When reviewing a comprehensive plan amendment uh, requests, we do look at future land use within one half mile. I have that on the screen. We have it identified as low, resi low density residential, suburban residential, and planned unit development. <laughs> Request was sent out for interdepartmental review. No objections or concerns were received. Staff's analysis of the request is that the applicant is in the process of planning the subject property through the city of Rapid City. The applicant has stated he has purchased the property, additional property to the north of the subject property to become proposed lot 11, which is on the screen. This additional property is included with the rezone request via meets and bounds description. The applicant has also stated that public water and sewer will be provided to the lot, eliminating the required existing on-site wastewater treatment system. The applicant's proposed uses of the property will be for worship services, refuge for handicapped persons, community garden, retail, sa retail sales of, grow of products grown on the property, small retail and public service supporting highway frontage and adjacent subdivisions, as well as an existing res single family residence to become a caretaker residence for the commercial operations. And staff did note that a caretaker residence is a conditional use permit in a commercial district, so the applicant will need to apply for that. With that, staff recommends approval of Comprehensive Plan Amendment CA 22-08. Chairman. Commissioner Adcock. Most of the time, I'll just be up straight. Um, I, I don't usually um, agree with taking suburban residential to commercial district, but I'll tell you on a major highway or an arterial, I think what's gonna happen for future land use in this area, it's gonna happen more and more. So I'll just tell you, uh, I've been a fan for commercial development on arterials and more commercial development in Rapid Valley. So for me, um, changing this to commercial on a major arterial um, <clears throat> is pretty, my personal opinion is, is a good thing to do. Mr. Chair. I'll move to approve rezone RZ 22-08. Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any public comment on this? Mr. Chair. Commissioner Troy. Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm going to abstain from items D and E, and my reasoning for that is because uh, the company that I work for has taken equipment over there for them to use work for, so I'm going to abstain from both those items. Okay. Um, Ron, you here want to just ask, answer questions, or did you want to make a statement on it? Or? No, I can tell you that I will, I will make a statement. 
Okay. Do you guys need my name? Is Ron Weifenbach. I live in um, Augusta Drive in Rapid City. I'll, the reason we changed this, we're working with the contractor right behind there to the north. They're going to put in a bunch of homes. We don't, in that little triangle was the only left in, right in, right out, left in, left out. So they're going to make a major road on that corner there. We worked with uh, the contractor on that. He's extended some of the boundaries to meet all the commercial zoning for the for the buildings and stuff inside that little triangle. You see where it's cut off to the left there? That's going to be a road in there and out of there. So it's the only one on the highway there. So and then we'll be looking at buying the three lots that are cut out in the middle there. So it'll be all there'll be a road to the north and then it'll all be part of that section so and if you have any questions I'm here to okay. answer them so any questions are on hearing none uh, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye aye, aye. opposed motion carried <clears throat> item E the reason no, I'm, I'm e sorry is... Kara yeah I got it okay so <laughs> Lloyd abstaining Lloyd abstaining yeah yep. okay <clears throat> Agenda item E is the follow-up rezone request, RZ22-08, to rezone 3.07 acres from Agriculture District to Commercial District. Again, the applicant and landowner is Ron Weifenbach. His agent is KTM Design Solutions. When determining a recommendation for a rezone request, we do look at current zoning within one half mile. We did find Agriculture District, Rural Residential District, Suburban Residential District, Urban Residential and planned unit development districts. Uh, with the previous request, it does match future land use. And with that, staff recommends approval of rezone 22-08. Any questions? Mr. Chair, Commissioner I think I approved that uh, out of order. I think that what I needed to approve was uh, CA 22-08, that last uh, item. What? Okay. There's two of them. The, 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 what you did on, okay. the, on your motion make, was you approved the change in the comprehensive plan. Okay. Just want to make sure. this would be on the zoning. Okay. I thought I said RZ22-08. That's why. Oh, I, I see. I this. see. And if you did, I didn't catch it. So it's got to be CA22-08. Okay. Okay. That's what Kara's got. Okay. okay. Thanks. Is there a motion on I'll this? I'll go ahead and make the motion now to approve uh, <laughs> rezone RZ22-08. Is there a second? Thank you. And a second. Any public comment? Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I'll, uh, I wanted to thank Brittany and Jason for, this was way more complicated than what it looks up there. And without their help, I don't think we would have got to this point, but it's, you know, because they needed that road and we didn't want to give it up, but we worked with them and we worked with the contractor to get to this point, but real professional in your office and I appreciate their help. Super, thank thanks. You. Appreciate you saying that. Uh, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Again, Commissioner LaCroix, abstention. Item F. Good morning again, Commissioners. Brittany Molitor, Planning Director. Item F is public hearing of Ordinance Amendment 0822-01 for Pennington County to add Section 321 Hard Rock Mining to the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance. Uh, the Planning Commission is recommending to continue Ordinance Amendment 0822-01 to the June 10th, 2022 Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, they did go through the ordinance and make quite a few changes, so they'd like the opportunity to have some more time with the document. So they're Move. recommending Thank approval. You. Got a motion and a second. Is, there, is this okay to the June 10th meeting? Yes. Is that what the motion was? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, any public comment? Not back on, back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Contested hearings. Good morning, commissioners. Madison Ryan, some environmental planner. Agenda item G is vacation of right-of-way VR 22-01 to vacate 430 feet of public right-of-way on Pretty Flower Lane, adjacent to Lot A of Lot 1 and Lot B of Lot 1 of Battle Creek Mountain Estates. The applicant owner is Karen Fonseca and the agent is D.C. Scott Surveyors. The location is 24355 Pretty Flower Lane. There is no special flood hazard on the property. The property is zoned Rural Residential District. The request was routed for inter-apartment review. 
Register of Deeds commented that Exhibit A needs to read in lots A and B of Lot 1 of Battle Creek Mountain Estate Subdivision. Staff has addressed this as a condition of approval. County Highway commented, a new turnaround must be established in accordance to Figure 1 of Subdivision Regulations. This was a condition of approval for layout plot 22-06 as they are in the plotting process. Analysis, the, pro the portion of the plotted pro right of way does not connect with any existing or future right of way alignments. The lots affected by the vacation of right of way have other legal access. The underlying property of the public right of way being vacated was never transferred from the original owner to the existing owner. Therefore, it needs to be transferred to the existing owner or the original owner needs to sign the plot. This will be addressed in the conditions of approval for the minor plot. Exhibit A was originally emailed in the planning department, therefore an original copy is required. Staff finds no significant issue with the applicant's request, as it appears to be in harmony with existing and future land use in the area. The planning commission recommended approval of vacation of right of way, VR 22 one with three conditions. So moved. Second. A motion and a second to approve uh, any public input. Back to the commission. Any further discussion? Not all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item H. Item H is road construction within a section line right of way, CS 22 05, for Terrence and Mardana Home to construct a road within the section line right of way between sections 10 and 15. Uh, this request has to do with the plat. It is in the three mile platting jurisdiction of Rapid City. There was public right of way that was platted over the section line right of way. So they are meeting the ordinance 14 standards in order to construct the road uh, because. Um, it does have to meet the city's requirements for road construction. So staff finds no significant issues with the applicant's request and is recommending approval with eight conditions. So moved. Get a motion and a second. Any public input? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item I. Item I is road construction within a section line right of way, CS 22-06 for Caputa Acres LLC. Milk Gut Connect is the owner to construct 600 feet of road within the section line right of way, otherwise known as a Wise Heart Road. Uh, he is requesting uh, to build this road at 17 feet. Uh, the highway department opposed the proposed road at 17 feet. There's also a question as to how the cul-de-sac will be created in the section line. Um, they want to ensure that this will not impede drainage or expansion to the north. And any road built within the section line must be built to ordinance 14 <coughs> standards. Um, they are requesting to improve this because they are looking at planting a 10 acre lot off to the north <coughs> along Weisshart Road. So this improvement will access that 10 acre lot. Um, the applicants will also need to obtain a subdivision regulations variance for the uh, road not being built to ordinance 14 standards for the subdivision, and that will be heard at a later date. But staff does recommend approval of road construction in the section line C22-06 with nine conditions. Questions? So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Hadcock. Is there a second? Second. And a second. Any public comment? Back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Item J is to request not to build to ordinance 14 standards for Trevor and Melinda Oberholt. Uh, they are requesting to waive the requirements to not submit engineered road construction plans and to waive the requirements to construct a turnaround. Two foot deep ditches, less than six inches gravel on the road width of 24 feet. The road will be constructed to 18 feet wide with a two to four inch gravel base and four inches of engineered fill. Uh, the highway department is opposed to waiving the ordinance 14 standards for road construction in the section line as any road built within or along the section line must, must be built to ordinance 14 standards. They are requesting this uh, in order to build a barn and a single family residence. Um, on those properties to the west of the section line. So this request is not for the road construction, just for the waivers of the Ordinance 14 standards. 
So they're proposing it at 18 feet? Yes, 18 feet with two to four inches of gravel and an engineered four inches of engineered fill. Chairman. Commissioner Adcock. Joe, our highway department. Superintendent. We've talked Morning. about this a whole lot, haven't we? So we have. Um, what happens if we don't have them do by 14? Because we're we are doing uh, ordinance 14. We're changing some of the standards, and then this isn't one of them on the section line. But um, for the public interest, I think we talked about this. Can we do road assessments? Can we do something where? Um, next person above that uh these people would have to build the whole road as you said not just the piece where they're at if i'm correct on the section line correct i, I believe they're proposing to i think i don't know what is this 14 16 here i'm not real I don't know what it is. so i believe that's off of highway highway 14 16 there <coughs> so with that being said uh once they put and build a road there, that's public right of way. Anybody can drive there. It's not just somebody's driveway. Um, it's just like Highway 1416. It's a public roadway. Anybody can go and drive there. So we need to make sure and, and ensure that it's safe for the traveling public. Um, and that's why Ordinance 14 is, um, uh, you know, has been in place since 2005. We're in the process. I've sent everybody a, a copy of the revised ordinance, and we're we're working towards getting that ordinance revised. Um, but thus, we're we're we still have the one in place from 2005. Um, as far as your question on road assessments, that's a question for the state's attorney. I don't know if that's possible, or how we even go about doing that. Well, here's the issue. So, since I've been here, which is a while. I think people need to build the road to the standards, but there's but um, to make somebody pay for other lots that are by them, like if they were the first lot, that's for me, that's no brainer. But if they're further down in the lots, whether it be a half mile, quarter mile, three miles, and to have to build all that road to standards um, is a lot of money for one person to put out. So I think there needs to be some kind of solution which we're not going to find today, that we either have to build those roads or we have to do something we don't have to. We have to. We need to work with the applicants, with the um, highway department in some way that we can either say we're going to have to assess people for those roads. When they come in, we build them, we assess them, or they build them, and we assess them. Because the biggest issue is, and we already know, you start with a smaller road, that road either gets smaller and smaller if you look at the county, or um, it's too small for development that by that time we said, well, Joe can do it and Deb did it and Ron did it and now Gary, you go ahead because we can't really make, you know, Gary do something that we did at the rents. So how do we get that done board? Um, I would ask that we start looking into some kind of solution of either assessing or something so we get our roads in the county so they're up to par, not only for the people that are building today, but the people that want to build on this road for the future. So what's that solution? We're not going to figure it out today, but I have a hard time. I, I, I kind of go back and forth. I have a hard time just letting this go with 18 inch gravel for the future when that's a section line. So those are my comments. Are they overholes here? I believe they are. Or Trevor's. Oh, no. <clears throat> Tell us your story. What now? Tell us your story. Well, it's only ever going to be my driveway, basically, is the way I look at it. And I guarantee it looks better than the one north of here. The one north isn't even close to 18 feet, I don't think. Chairman. Commissioner Hatka. Oh, there lies the the problem guys so um the one is it even close to what his is going to be so we've started something um not because i'm saying you did anything wrong i'm saying in general if we let you do 18 feet we let the guy i'll put in there. the culvert and stuff so it's able to be wider he's actually putting in a 75 foot long culvert 
Right, but the road um, into it is not improved. So then what we have, if we keep letting someone come down that section line, um, we'll have 18 feet. Um, if someone decides to build below you and we'll have that first set going onto that highway, small. So that doesn't make sense to me, sir, uh, at this point, if we're gonna do development and start doing development and you're the, unfortunately, the person that did it first, um, you're, you're gonna have a small road entering into, there's a lot of lots right there, into a development. Which lots are you referring to? I don't say a lot of lots. What's that? <clears throat> Which lots are you looking at here? This, it's a section line, 1416 is in front of the, set. okay, the section line goes oh, north, north, right, south, and the road is east-west, if I'm correct, 1416, right? So you're gonna come down, you're gonna miss the first person that has two lots. So that's gonna be a smaller road. Then you're gonna hit you, which is gonna be an 18 inch road. Then somebody below you is gonna want, right? 18 inch road 18 or smaller, 18, 18, 18 feet, feet, inches. Where did I get inches? <laughs> no wonder you guys are like, nobody's home. Sorry, getting a little bit of a headache, but long story short, um, how big's the road to start to go in there? Joe, have you seen it? I have not been out to this place. Mr. Oberholt? The road to start where? Sean, I believe, has been out on the... 16 into your lot, sir? Yeah. How, how wide is 1416? No. How wide is the road above you to the north? Oh, it's not very... Sean has been out on site. And... Sean Smith, Highway Department. Um, it's essentially, it's a two-track trail right now coming off of Highway 1416. It's unimproved. It's okay. The north, is that what you're talking about? No, to the south. Oh, okay. It's a trail. To so off of 14 is a trail into this into his 18 inch road or 18 inch I guess 18 he's inch, 18 feet. he's proposing to put an 18 yeah. foot road surface to his place right now is what he's proposing from 1416 from 1416 okay I misunderstood mr oh. Oval Holt I'm brain dead on this so, one Mr. So, sure hold on just a sec Ron so you're taking 1416 you're taking the road all the way from 1416 south to your property feet. Yes, to 18 feet instead of 24. Yes. Okay, I'll be good. quiet then. I know Four you want- Four inches of engineered backfill and I'm gonna put two inches of good gravel on top of it. Okay. And then I want an option to put two inches later on after it compacts. So I apologize. Okay. Boy, you um, confused. <laughs> uh, well, I confused myself, I think it looks like. I, I should have saw the red line, but I thought you were just putting in just where your property was, not all the way above. The 24 okay. inch, the one or 24 the, feet. The What's section that? line, sorry. The section line north of there? Yes. I mean, it's not even 18 feet, I don't think. So let me ask you something, Mr. Oval. If that's um, a trail, it's muddy, mm -hmm. it's horrible. I have cows out there, I gotta go check. So you're gonna fix that to 18 feet standards on the section line to start on 1416. That's what you're yes, saying? Yes, to 18 feet. And Joe, your standards are 24 feet. Correct. Give me just a moment. So uh, really you're talking uh, the amount of material, right? He's already there. He's already going to be building the road. Um, so I'm doing my math correctly. It's 196 extra tons of material that would be needed, uh, extra tons of gravel. Not that's just for the surface and gravel at four inches. Um, you know, our price for gravel delivered um, I would say probably 20 to $25 a ton, depending on where he's gonna get it. I'm assuming probably Pete Lean or wherever. Um, so you're talking, another, we'll just go 25 for a high number, right? You're talking an extra 5,000 bucks. You know, call it, call it $10,000 if you're talking the engineered fill um, with the gravel. So you're really not talking all that much more money. He's already there doing the work. It's really not that much more to build that road to a 24 foot standard. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Oscar, when you say not that much money, I guess that depends on who you're talking to, Joe. Oh, absolutely. I would agree 100%. I, totally, I don't support a 24-foot road going to a, a lot or to a home site. But the 18-foot, uh, based on the uh, two to four inches of gravel and four inches of engineered fill, I could live with that. Uh, the thing you have to keep in mind is this is not just his driveway. Yep. It's a public road. Okay, so if I understand it, the public road goes south one and a half miles to Highway 44? 
I don't know if it it could potentially end up there. It looks like, but I don't know. That, that's what it looks like to me. So well, that's actually the railroad, isn't it? I don't see a lot of development going south. I mean, that's just the way I see it today. But ultimately, it's a public road, Mr. So, Chairman, Commissioner Laster. Does that mean then you'll take it over that the county will be obligated to maintain that gravel road once he puts it in? At that standard not necessarily but it's by state statute it is our responsibility mr. chair are you done uh, commissioner lacroix sir would you be in a compromise instead of 18 going to 20. i would rather not i mean this thing's just going to be my driveway yeah okay. i mean sure he says it's going to be a county road but if somebody gets lost they might come down in a 20 uh, he's talking tw you know 20 30 years from now it could end up and, and if I may, um, it, it will be, by state statute, a county road. It's a road built within a section line. It is our responsibility. So will I get snow removal or none? That is something that's decided by these, the board. So I'll go to 20 if I get snow removal. <laughs> <laughs> well, How about well, 24 in snow removal? Yeah. So Mr. Overholt, <laughs> do you have, from, from where you're, from where the red line ends there now the heavy red line is there access from there down to 44 i mean can you no, no you can't no. get through there okay. i wouldn't go down there it's there's not railroad tracks not a trail. in the way and you can't there's a fence in the way you can't get down okay there. okay yeah okay. mr mr Oholt, do you own south your own you're getting buying both those lots i already bought them Okay, and you're only going to develop on one of those lots? Uh, the first one has a two pole barns already. Well, one and one and a half, I guess. It's not built done yet. And I want to build a house on the south lot, right where that ends. Okay, so you're you're taking, are you doing the whole section line all the way down in the two squares, or are you just doing the just frontage? Just where I need to, which is right, let's get this mouse, right about here. Just getting far enough in there where you can get a driveway in. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I have to check my animals out there every day and we're tearing the hell out of it anyway. If I may, Sean just pointed out one, one thing here as well. So these lots have platted public right of way right here. So at some point or another, this will be public, you know, this will be more access for these three lots or four lots, excuse me. Well, Chairman, he's right because he can't, they're not gonna be able to access off 44. So 1416. there's 1416. I'm going to get this right yet on this one. I don't know why I'm confusing myself. <laughs> All those Bottom. lots there already have their driveways in the front. Right. They, if they improve the road on 1416, uh, they will probably make them go to that public access later, if I'm correct, just because once that road gets busy enough, which I see in the next five to 10 years is going to get um, a lot of traffic, a lot more traffic. Um, Sir, in the past, um, and I've been here for a while, we, I always agreed that that was probably okay to do that because it was um, not developed before. I figured there's a different solution, but I also believe um, we were trying to, to do something different for the future in Pennington County with infrastructure and make it so we're not having pieces and parts of areas that only have certain size roads. Because again, if you drive in Pennington County, you're gonna see people that they call it their driveways that we've actually ended up, they put them on county roads because they're in section lines or other stuff. So I think it for me um, that if you were three miles or something in and you had something like that going on, it'd probably be a little bit different, but Again, I probably won't agree with this today um, because of it's got some public right away behind it. 18 feet. I'm going to agree with Joe. Um, 18 feet, 24 feet. Um, I think it needs to start here, sir, just because you're right off that major arterial. For the comments. I don't have a motion. No, I'll make the motion. I'm going to approve the exception for an 18 foot wide road to the four inches of gravel base and four inches of engineered fill. Is there a second? I'll second. 
I'll do a substitute um, quest to have it up to Ordinance 14 standards um, with a waiver of required turnaround on it to construct a turnaround. Second. Okay. Got a motion and a second. Substitute motion and a second to bring it up to uh, 14 standards. Um, I, I guess I missed that. Oh, the turnaround. Without it. And construct a turnaround. With, with so all the rest of the motion would be effective in the substitute motion? Yes, and he does it without having to construct the turnaround. Oh, without having to construct. Okay. Yes. Okay, I've got a substitute motion and a second. Is there a further discussion? The, Mr. Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. That's, this is why I brought up the, the compromise. I, I think with a 20 foot wide road to that section line, that it would not be, you know, that was something I talked to the highway department about at a minimum 20 would be better than 18. And that, that's why I throw out the 20. So I just wanted to pass that on in case I yep. have to make a motion. Yeah. Any further discussion on the substitute motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. <clears throat> Lasser. So Joe, correct me if I'm wrong or somebody who said it. 1416 going north, those four lots up there, do they already have access to 1416? Um, because understanding that that's a, a plotted uh, right away down there. That's why I'm kind of interested in this being the 14 standards because if we somebody moves into those four lots and we develop them and we mandate that they go down there, then now you're going to be maintaining, a, most likely we're going to be maintaining a road. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of concerned about that. Can you explain about that a little bit? So I don't know if these have lots have been built on. It looks like they have currently access. I don't know when these were subdivided. At some point they had to have put plot the public right of way in here. Um, but you're correct. If these are built on um, and there's public right of way right here, we will request that the access come from the south side. Can I speak? Uh, sure. All those lots already have driveways on forks and sixteen. They do? Yep. How many 100%. acre lots are those? The guy in the third lot just put in his. How many acre lots are there? Could they be split? Do they, do they have homes? Yeah, the first one does is Brian Johnson. Do they I have approach? From him do you know if they have approach permits? The, the one guy three down, or the guy right next to Brian just put in an approach permit. So I'm sure if I could just be briefly, this is Megan Kruger at the state's attorney's office. So there is a difference between ag access and an actual approach permit. Um, so as far as I'm aware from what Sean is telling me is that those are ag access, not actual approach permits. So they are different legally. I, without doing any research in our office, I don't know if those are permitted approach permits. Sean doesn't seem to recall, but I don't know if Mark did those prior to him um, without doing some research in our office. But again, Megan's correct is they very well could be egg accesses or they could be putting approaches in without permission. It's hard to say. Mr. Chairman, follow up. So if they put a house out there, then they would have probably got a building permit and then an approach permit. So either if they put a house out there, then it could have gone out there illegally, potentially. Are you saying there's houses on those properties? There's a Brian Johnson, and I'm sure he went in for a permit. He does a lot of work. He's a contractor, so I'm sure he got a permit. The guy next door just put in an access. He's putting in a prefab. And the guy next to him has been there a little bit. Without being rude, we've had a lot of contractors come in later. I heard that, <laughs> Not I heard that, that, that that'd be him, sir. I doubt but that, that doesn't guarantee it anymore that I've seen. All right. People do things without following the rules many a time. So that's why that's why I started asking these questions here. I mean, if you're only allowed one access, that road will never be a deal. The back road shouldn't. Mr. Chair. Commissioner LaCroix. Question for Joe. Joe. <laughs> you guys sat down. I know. You know, Joe. It, we had a discussion a little bit this morning. We threw out 20 foot. And I, 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 in this point, I, I kind of see it as a good compromise because if something does, you know, things change in there, say they split those lots, then they need access to them that backside. It wouldn't be that much more work to make. I mean, it's gonna cost more, but 
and I get both sides. It's a driveway for right now, but 20, 30 years from now, it could, might not be. It might go all the way to 44. So what's your thoughts on that 20 foot? I think it would be a good compromise, but I would stand firm that I think you guys, the commission needs to start somewhere and start enforcing Ordinance 14. We've, you know, there's been a lot of work that's been put into it. We put a lot of work into it trying to get it updated. Um, yes, we did put some language in it for exceptions, um, but there is, a, you know, I think Megan would be proud of me if I say this, you know, there's rules for a reason. Um, and we have to start enforcing the rules. Um, you know, I, I, it's a section line and ultimately it's, it's public right of way. Once a road is put on there, I get, I 100% agree that it, it, it's a, his driveway for right now. But as soon as there's a road built there, it, it, it's public right of way and people from the public can drive there. It's not like he's putting a, 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 his own driveway off of Highway 1416. He's putting it on a section line so anybody can drive down there. You know, if you're, you're a small game hunter, you can, you can drive down it and hunt game within the right of way. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Roskinen. What I look at is every one of these are going to be different. You're going to have uh, a higher density and every you know, I look at the merits and I just don't see uh, going south. Uh, you, that train don't look that good. I'm just saying based on what I've seen today, I don't really agree with the 24 foot. Can I make a substitute to the substitute? <laughs> uh, I think we have to uh, take care of the, the first substitute. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, Chair, oh. go ahead. this is about what two miles east of me, Joe, roughly. I think I believe so. Yeah, you have 160. I will, I'm on 162nd. 162nd is a section line road. It's developed Ordinance 14 standards, and there's two of us mm -hmm. that utilize that road. It's just it just dawned on me as I'm sitting there watching this. I'm like. Wait a minute. That's just east of where I'm at, um, and having that 162nd road, I you know, for the two of us, um, it gets pretty good use because we're ranchers out there. But I can see how this is going to if we move. I don't know. I'm going to guess those are 10 acre lots or 20 acre lots. Um, if we move that much traffic out there, you're going to want a good sturdy road. That's just Damn my me. input on it. I'll try to get this right. <laughs> For some reason, this one was not for me. Um, so the bottom line is, when you were going to build your house, you had your I'll barn there. If I end up having to go to Ordinance 14, just okay. To be honest. Okay. So I guess that was my question. Um, without sounding hopefully rude, I usually put in my budget, and I usually go check. Uh, when I go buy something, all oh, the everybody issues. Everybody that bought these lots, the guy in front of me is supposed to build the road in front of his property. Right in our buying deal, and I didn't realize how big of a deal this was gonna be. Okay, and we're, we're, we're trying to compromise in one sense, but we're also trying to make sure for the future, uh, they spent days and days on the Ordinance 14, uh, revised Ordinance 14, and they did that for a reason because of the same thing we're doing today. Uh, we wanna compromise in a sense and, and be a good board, but the other sense is that we're compromising somebody else when we're giving you a compromise. Make sense? Yeah. So it's not that I, I wouldn't want to do that to save you money in a sense, but I also have to think of the people that are coming after you. Um, I, I just can't see it after all the work that was done and what it was. Like I said, if there was diff different circumstances and it was a lot longer um, road, I'd probably might do the compromise. I think that's where we're going today or some of the board members, but um, there's a policy and procedure for things for a reason. And we had people go do the work on it for a reason because we're having these kind of problems in Pennington County. So um, I feel your pain in a sense because I've been there, done that. <laughs> but the other, um, I got to start somewhere and uh, I like keeping infrastructure so it works for everybody. Okay, we've got a substitute motion which uh, requires it to meet standards 14 without the turnaround. Any further discussion on that? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Aye. Nay. That motion died. So now we're back to the original motion. Um, the original motion is to uh, have the turnaround 
but an 18 foot wide road. Mr. Chair, can I make a substitute Ross, motion? I... Substitute motion. My substitute motion would be wave the turnaround and go to uh, 20 foot opposed to 18 foot, as I mentioned in my first motion. Second. We got a motion and a second. Chairman. Everybody understand the motion? Yep. Chairman. Commissioner Hadcock. Where'd the guy go? I think he's out in the hallway. That's great. Let's see if he wants to agree to that. He didn't before. Young man, <laughs> we're, they're talking of a compromise up here of a 20 foot road instead of the 18. Yep. Are you willing to put in the 20 foot road if that's the compromise? I think so. As long as I can waive all the engineering plans and all the other stuff. And just we have waive the turnaround. Guide. And waive the turnaround in this motion too. Yeah. What now? And waiving the turnaround in this motion also. Yeah. So, I would, I would almost like to do a turnaround, to be honest, yeah. just in case somebody comes down there. Okay. Gary, you have the motion? Okay. The substitute hold on. motion? Hold on. I'm assuming it's everything the same besides it's a 20 foot instead of 18 foot. 20 okay. foot instead of an 18 and, and no, no turn turnaround. And no turnaround. Yeah. So, I can use an engineered fill from Dick Aldrin's right up the road. So, Joe, um, <clears throat> does, what is his process? Does he have to have engineering plans and all that stuff to do a road, or can he? I think he's requesting to waive all this Ordinance 14 standards, which includes engineered stuff, correct? Yeah. Brittany? Oh. I don't know what his request exactly is. Brittany, is he requesting to waive the engineered plans as well? Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. And that would be part of my motion then, my substitute motion. No, I think the call aside could be his own. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? On the substitute motion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Okay, so now we're at three to two. Three to two. Three to two. Three to two. It passes. Um, so it passed, and so that takes care of the original motion. Okay. Item K. Item K is road construction within a section line right of way CS22 07 for Trevor and Melinda Overholtz to construct 1,400 feet of road within the section line between sections 33 and 34. Uh, this is the section line for the previous request. And staff is recommending approval of road construction in the section line right of way with nine conditions. So moved. I got a motion and a second. Uh, any public comment? Back to the commission. All those in favor of the motion to keep it saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item L. Item L is public hearing of comprehensive plan amendment CA 22-07 for Jack and Marie Ziemer to amend the comprehensive plan to change the future land use from rural residential district to low density residential district. Uh, the property uh, consists of 2.5 acres. It's currently zoned agriculture district. It has a single family residence, a garage and some outbuildings. The property is off of Pactola Drive and Jack's Court. There is no special flood hazard on the property, um, there's a, so when considering um, changing the comprehensive plan, we look at surrounding zoning and the current zoning. The future land use is rural residential, which requires a three acre lot size uh, because the two lots, they are looking at combining two lots to decrease density. Uh, and in order to do that for the plat, they need to do the rezone. And because they don't meet the future land use for rural residential at the three acres, they have to go down to the low density residential district. Uh, in the area, most of the property is zoned agriculture. There is some suburban residential district in the area to the south. Um, this area is served by a community water system and private wastewater treatment systems. Um, it is located within the Pactola Estates Road District. Um, the Pactola Estates Road District does maintain an 18 to 24 foot wide gravel road. Uh, does again have the community water system and served by an individual wastewater system. 
This was routed around to the interdepartmental review. No objections or concerns were received. The applicant would like to consolidate the lots. Um, this will decrease density within the lots. Um, staff finds no significant issues with the request as it appears to be in harmony. Uh, staff did recommend approval of this. However, the Planning Commission did recommend denial of this comprehensive plan amendment. They did have concerns uh, that this could be uh, subdivided down further uh, with a half acre lot size because of the community water system. Uh, the applicant is here. Uh, he does have photos that he would like to show uh, the board of the property to show uh, the topography and the unlikelihood that it could be subdivided down. Um, so just with that, I would like to- Chairman. Chairman I move approval based on staff recommendations. I'll second that motion. Sure. Got a motion and a second. Does that actually follow staff recommendation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Chairman, I say that is because of uh, topography, and um, they did combine these lots for a reason to make this a bigger lot to try to um, move forward with the existing uh, surroundings. So that's why, uh, for me, um, they tried to make a difference to be as close as they could with what they had. Um, to the density that was in the um, area for the future and um, with a note also that they weren't going to subdivide, so. Okay. So, uh, Commissioner Roskinect, were you on the Planning Commission? I was on the Planning ones? Commission and I did, I did not approve that denial because everything they're doing, uh, to me, they're going in the right direction. They're trying to take two lots and combine them. Uh, anytime you can do that in that particular subdivision, I think you're uh, on the right track. Yeah. Okay. And Chairman, if I could, um, I did speak with the applicant and there was some concern with that interior lot line with them meeting setbacks and future development because of the topography. Uh, so that's the reason that they would like to combine it um, to have that buildable area to meet setbacks. Okay. Is there any public comment? Good. Back to the commission. Uh, all those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Rezone. Item M is public hearing of rezone RZ22-07 for Jack and Marie Ziemer to rezone 2.5 acres from agriculture district to low density residential district. Again, planning commission recommended to deny without prejudice rezone RZ22-07 uh, for the same concerns as with the comprehensive plan. Uh, the lots will consist of 2.5 acres. Uh, the current zoning is agriculture district. Again, there is a lot of open space and agriculture in the area. Uh, staff did recommend approval of rezone 22-07. And now that the comprehensive plan amendment is approved, it is in alignment with the comprehensive plan. Chairman. Commissioner Hancock. Move, move approval based on staff recommendation. Second. Got a motion and a second. Is there public input on this one? Back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. <laughs> Item N. Item N or sorry, N, is public hearing of rezone RZ21-30 for Paul H.H. Renke Family Trust, where your associates is the agent, to rezone 9.541 acres from suburban residential district to agriculture district. Uh, Planning Commission did recommend to deny without prejudice rezone RZ21-30. Uh, this has been in front of the Planning Commission, the board, on several occasions. Uh, the reason that they requested this rezone is in order to plat this property. Um, because the 9.541 acres doesn't meet the minimum requirements for agriculture district. They are not intending to file this plat, so staff is recommending also to deny this without prejudice until such time they file the plat. So moved. Thank okay. you. Got a motion to deny? Is that? Without prejudice. Without prejudice. Okay. Without prejudice. And the second came from Commissioner Lasseter. Uh, any public input? <laughs> Back to the commission. Any further discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item O. 
Item O is public hearing of plan unit development overlay PU 22-06 for Katie Sornova and Brett Walfish to, a plan, to allow a plan unit development overlay to allow a single family residence to be used as a summer winter educational music camp to allow off season musical performance concerts each year to allow shed cabins to be used for classes and rehearsals and a bed and breakfast. Uh, Staff did recommend denial of plan unit development PU 22-06 with prejudice until Klondike Road is improved. Planning Commission um, did recommend deny, to deny without prejudice the plan unit development. Uh, staff will go over the criteria and the findings. Uh -huh. The uses on the proposed PUD overlay district conform to the uses by right or conditional uses permitted in an agriculture district. Yes, the uses of the proposed PUD overlay district are of a type and are located to minimize detrimental influence upon surrounding properties. Yes, the uses of the proposed overlay district meet the standards governing. So this actually should be no. The uses do not meet uh, the proposed overlay district do not meet the standards of the parking areas in the road. Um, that was the biggest concern coming in from staff. Um, yes, the proposed PUD overlay district involves 17 acres. Yes, the proposed PUD overlay district is owned by the applicants and managers, Brett Walfish and Katie Swernova. And <coughs> Uh, no, Klondike Road is an average of 12 foot wide road that is not within a road district or maintained by County Highway. Um, there was quite a bit of concern with the road in this area. Um, that was the biggest concern that staff had. This is an actual rendering of the home with the two, um, they're basically like cabins for the, for the students to stay in. Um, there's their proposed parking area. That's the structure currently under construction. Um, Jerome Harvey, the fire administrator and a staff member did drive that road, did meet with some of the neighbors and um, there were significant concerns on the width of the road and the ingress and egress to that area for this proposed use. Um, staff did meet with the applicants again last week um, to discuss some options with this plan unit development overlay. Um, they did um, are going to request that this does get, get continued until staff and them could work uh, together with some proposed conditions um, to address some of the concerns of the neighbors. Um, so that is kind of where we're at with this request. Okay, so, so it's... The applicants are in the audience if you okay. have questions. So the intent is, is that this will be continued at an undetermined date. Is that what I'm understanding? You Until the May 17th, 2022. I think that because of the... There was quite a bit of public comment at the Planning Commission meeting. I think we do need to set a time so that the public is available or know when well, that date eventually is. Eventually, I'm going to have a motion to uh, continue until May 17th. Correct. But I'm going to allow uh, both the applicant and anybody here uh, in opposition or in favor to testify today. So if Mr. Um, uh, Walfish... Not Mr. Oh, man, <laughs> oh. Hi, I'm, I'm Katie Smirnova, I'm his wife. Okay. Um, I figured he spoke last time, so it was only fair that I share responsibilities. So I'm here to answer any questions. Um, my husband and I are trying to work with um, the Planning and Zoning Office to try to reach some kind of a compromise. We absolutely understand the concerns. Um, so we are really um, looking forward to having the two weeks to see what we can do um, to address those concerns. But any questions sure. from... Okay. Commissioner Edgar. So have you visited with the surrounding areas to see if they had some kind of compromise? Because it seems like that's... I mean, you got you got some road issues, it sounds like. Um, some neighbors, most of the time, if you visit with the neighbors or have a neighborhood meeting, not all the time, but sometimes they find that they can compromise in some areas and then it works out for both both sides. So, Sure. So we did, uh, we did host a meeting at our new property. Um, two of the neighbors showed up. Um, one of our neighbors was, uh, I think she wrote a letter of approval for what we're doing. She's excited to be able to walk up our driveway and hear some classical music. Um, I did 
personally call uh, as many neighbors as I could with whom I uh, for whom I had phone numbers and then I emailed the rest of them so I did reach out to all of the neighbors um, we proposed potentially taking any events uh, off the table altogether which would alleviate um, any sort of traffic um, we spoke with the county to see you know if we could improve the road we would be willing to take on that cost um, have you have you by chance changed this more than once uh, we're we're in the process of changing it. So it was just cha it was just the first time, and then and then this time, it, this time you're going to go back and and make some more changes. Yes. So so I would um, give you some advice. Maybe go to the neighbors, and try again and see if some of their concerns can be met. But again, you saw on roads the cost of roads and the different things that need to be improved in those areas. We would be um, willing to do that. Yes, ma'am. So just just keep that in mind because last person that on the road, it was it, it's the cost of the roads and stuff, and um, all that comes into consideration when you make changes of use. So absolutely. Um, just just word of advice, just a Thank little you. bit. <laughs> Any okay. advice is greatly appreciated. We're um, you know we're willing to do whatever it takes. You know we're excited to live in this beautiful area. Um, you know when we bought this land, um, we specifically you know be, so um, this is not a you know. A, a month ago, we decided to use this for the festival. We've, we've, my husband and I have been thinking about how we can make music education here in this community accessible to children. Um, and it was about three years ago when we realized that after doing all the outreach, we had kids coming up to us and saying, do you have scholarship? Could you, could you, could we attend your three week program? Um, and you don't understand the feeling that you, you get when you look at a kid in, in the eyes and you say, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. So ma'am, um, you, what you're doing is very positive. You might have to scale down maybe to a certain extent so the neighbors are comfortable and you're comfortable with what you're doing and still be able to do a positive thing that you're doing. You. So we're not, we're not shutting you down. We're just, we're just saying that um, maybe the neighbors have some compromise in you for what you want to do for something positive for your community. So um, you. it's, it is very emotional for you. But again, um, try to find some of those compromises and some of those things that um, for the future, it sounds like you're doing some really positive stuff for people. So thank you. I was wondering if anyone, um, any of the commissioners have any other ideas for how we can um, work this out? Mr. Um, Chair. Commissioner Oscar. So Katie, the, originally did it just start out as a conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. And then, if I understand it, upon county's recommendations, if you're going to want to do this and you're going to do this, and not saying you're going to do it tomorrow, but eventually that could happen or it might not happen. Sure. And I've done a PUD myself on a very complex piece of property, and, and I followed that. I might want to build a shed for my backhoe, so put it in there. You don't want to have to go back and do an amendment. And I think this is where things got a little off track, was that you had so much stuff in there, stuff that you might do, stuff that you might not have done, but instead of going back and doing an amendment that was there in place, if you were going to go that direction. And then when the neighbors saw that, I think it just got a little overwhelming. And I think, so... Yeah. Um, as I said, uh, baby steps, little baby steps, get the trust of neighbors, and and uh, unfortunately, that uh, <laughs> PUD is a, a, a little aggressive for that neighborhood and for that road. But uh, I'm I'm with them. I'm uh, I'm all in favor of a compromise. Thank and you. Neighbors working together with you. Yeah, and I, I would like to say that when we. Um, we, we've worked with three various um, people at the Planning and Zoning Office, and we, we were encouraged to create a wish list for everything possible that we would have. So in, in doing so, I feel like we also misrepresented our own uses. Um, you know, we, we, we don't have off-season concerts. Um, all, all of our concerts usually happen within the community. We just applied for a $100,000 grant to create um, a beta van, a, a portable venue where we can go directly to the people and have these concerts. 
really what we're looking for is a place to host our 18 to you know 20 to up to up to 24 students and then our teachers who are long you know lifelong friends of ours who are incredibly passionate about teaching and our kids truly do from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., they're with their instruments, and they're not, you know, they're not beginners. They've kid, they're kids who've dedicated their lives to this. So that was our way of of saying we can have this free program, you know, taking any sort of financial circumstances off the table for these families. Mr. Chair, yeah, uh, <clears throat> I I agree with with Deb and Rom both. I think when I was receiving some of the phone calls and some of the comeback, I. I tried to explain to some of the people that exactly when you go on with staff, they say, you, you know, you need to think so you don't have to come back. But in this case, and you're dealing with the hills nowadays and people are sensitive. I mean, they don't trust. I mean, it's, I, I shouldn't say don't trust, but I mean, w once you approve such a big outlay, you see a lot of these resort type things spots in, in the hills and so it's scary to them they don't want that sure. so I think you know I just got to review this over the weekend so even I was Larry when I drove it yesterday I was like wow you know so I think the time to to let the dust settle and and work with have this this public hearing and maybe let some of the residents explain openly to you and you hear that, maybe there's something that could be compromised. Maybe instead of the overlay, maybe it'll be a conditional use permit for a while. You know, sure. I mean, that might be what it is. I don't know. Mr. Chair. Hey, Commissioner Ruskin. Uh, what was the original, uh, the conditional use permit? What, what was the scope of that, Katie? It was for the festival to use our property to host the students and faculty and hold classes and performances. And then I th we, we didn't realize that if we put cabins, uh, sheds, they're, they're sheds, um, to use for teaching violin lessons, cello lessons, that that would be an, another use. And then we would be living there 100% of the time. That would be our future home. Um, so as, as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we were told that as long as there are two uses, um, it, it is no longer a conditional use and it has to be a planned unit development overlay and it is something that uh, we wanted to actually apply for sooner but I, I understand it was going through several months of revision so that's why we're quite a few months behind schedule here but we were advised to apply for that so how important is uh, the bed and breakfast part of this equation so when we started this project, we started with, so my husband's aunt passed away. We had $600,000 that we said we could either invest and move away and, you know, retire, or we could build something that we could use to better our community. And we started with that. Um, as you know, the pro all of the building materials have skyrocketed. So that's why we're, we're trying to find ways to offset this. Sure. Any other questions to Katie before we, I have at least four people here that would like to speak. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie. Uh, first one I have is uh, Doug Zog. Uh, as Doug comes up, I will explain. I've talked to Doug on the phone, <clears throat> and I have driven out to the uh, property. So, Doug? It's I'm Doug serious. Zog. I live at uh, 13249 Klondike Road, and I have spoken with everybody here, um, so I won't make it too long. You already pretty much know my opinion on everything. Um, there are no residents that approve this. Uh, there's nobody in the neighborhood that approves what they have planned. Um, I don't know if Katie was talking about the Hamptons, but they, they do not own where they live. They're renters, so I don't really count them um, as being you know, an opinion in the area because they don't own the property. Um, we just, we really don't want a commercial business in a residential setting. And that's basically what it is. Um, everybody just owns a single family home. It's quiet, it's just a residential area. So we're just not interested in having a, a commercial business in the middle of it. Um, I, I was looking through the, the Pennington County Comprehensive Plan for the Black Hills area. And there was a quote in there that says, this area will primarily have a focus on rural residential, ranch at residential, agriculture, and open space to ensure that the natural character remains intact 
as growth occurs. Um, and this was looking forward through 2040. Um, and I think you're gonna be changing the natural character of that area by allowing this. And that, that's basically going against what your comprehensive plan is stating. Um, along with the, we, that we don't want commercial, you're, you're gonna be increasing traffic, which is gonna be causing a burden um, to us and basically all the surrounding landowners. Um, and then there, there's multiple safety issues. You know, if you've been back there, you've driven down Highway 16 to make the turn on the Klondike. And, and that, that's, it's very dangerous just for us, let alone, you know, 20 or 30 cars trying to access that area. You know, and then and leaving is, is, is the same as well. There's no turn lane. And it, it's just a bad corner coming from both directions where you can't see traffic coming very well. Um, so Doug, you've lived there how long? I've been there six and a half years. I've owned my property for 10. Okay. Is there another uh, access in and out of that? Just through my property, which goes on a teepee road, which is just a, I mean, call it a two track. You know, it's a forest service trail basically. So there's really no emergency exit. Um, I think Jerome's the fire guy. Yep. Yeah, he came out and looked at it. And basically what he stated is that, you know, it's a lot gate for one, um, but if you got 20 or 30 people and there's a fire and it's dark, he said they probably can't even get an unlocked gate open half the time, you know, because everybody's panicking and trying to, to, get, to evacuate the area as quick as they can. Okay. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Roskin. Is that a uh, Forest Service uh, uh, lock on that gate? Or is that? There is a Forest Service lock on it, yep. Okay. So the people that live there don't have access to open that lock? We do. Oh, you do? Okay. We do. And it's just been like that since I moved there. And the people that owned the property before had owned it for, I think, 40 years maybe, maybe longer, 40 or 50 years. And that's where I got a key for it. Was from them when I purchased the property. So, oh, Chairman, do they? If it's Forest Service, don't you have to have permission as a residence to have access on Forest Service Road? Well, my property uh, onto it, just to access it. You and um, the couple. Anybody can drive on the Forest Service Road from the other direction too, but they can't come through our property. That's what I'm saying on a lot gate. Don't you? Um, do you know that, Megan? Do you have to have, we just went through this, didn't we? They don't have a lock gate on theirs. Do they have to have access, meaning a permit from the Forest Service? In some instances, yes, you have to have a special use permit through the Forest Service to access certain portions of it. Um, I do believe they have one in that front portion because it is it does go through Forest Service from Highway 16. So there's a small portion of Klondike Road that's on Forest Service So lands. does Doug and the applicant both need to go, is it a, this, so they change the names on the Forest Service um, access? Because we had to do that, do you guys remember that? We needed to do that on um, the land that was out on Prairie, what's it called, Prairie Road, I don't remember the. But this gate just goes out on TP. This isn't the main access. Yeah, this is just, there's just like a short portion of it that goes through Forest Service lands to access TP Road. It's like a short Forest that, Service road. That's where the same with that one access that we just went through. It just a, was a short piece of, of the road, but it needed a Forest Service um, basically saying, you know, you can use this access. In some instances they do, and we require that if they have access to a private piece of property through Forest Service lands, it's almost like getting an approach permit. It's right. kind of that same type of concept. But this doesn't have to happen even, even if it's a lock gate access? Right, and in, in some instances, even like with Schroeder Road, they've come back and say, well, you know, you can access it, but it's not something that they want. It's not usable for, you know, traffic type Multi of thing, because it's not built to a standard or Anything That's why like I'm that. asking, even if legality wise, that they can build, unfortunately, um, the applicant on this road because of it would not be used for one applicant, it would be used for more of a commercial business. Does that make sense? And that's what I was asking on the one we were talking about on 
called prairie chicken, but it's not prairie chicken. Right. Well, if they if they wanted to improve that road on Forest Service, they would have to go through a special use permit. They would have to go through a lot of different things to actually bring in and, and construct on Forest Service lands. So the applicant knows that? Well, that isn't hasn't been an issue because that's like the going out of it. It's oh, it's not into this. No, this it's area. not into the portion to access. It's past that property. But there is Forest Service. There's a small section from Highway 16 to Klondike Road, which right. is like it's right here. Yep, an eighth mile maybe, and that is Forest Service. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm asking if that could be used for commercial use, meaning. I know if people are hiking or four wheeling, they 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 use those. But I'm saying in general for commercial use, instead of residential use, is it permitted or you don't know? I don't know. You would have to look at the terms of their special use permit because all of them are different. And Doug, I think I was asking on that, and to make sure that the younger couple knows that that they might have to get that permit. Maybe they already have um, to do that. So show up, Brittany, before you leave. Oh. So on this road, uh, that picture was just up there. Uh, on that road, is that an easement through private properties? Yes, Klondike Road is an easement path because this portion right here is the Forest Service. The rest of it is an easement or easements. They're platted easements. It was recently, so there you can see that they're platted easements through here. 66 foot How do you, access easements. So I heard Katie say that they're willing to to redo the road. But how do you how do you do that through an easement? How do you, what what kind of permission do you have to have to uh, redo the road? Well, those are access easements. So from our office, they wouldn't need any special permission through us or the um, highway department. It would just be getting a construction permit, basically for the dirt work because they're private access easements. So as far as, I mean, that's 66 feet, they have 66 feet to build it and it's almost like a right of way. Okay. Unless it's a change of use. So if it's, if, if it's considered a change of use, would they still have permission to go through there? It's just a wide access easement. So there isn't any, when they look at, when we look at like, plat, those were platted as 66 feet because this was a plat that was done not that long ago, um, it's to access, the, we look at the number of lots that it accesses and the zoning district. You're not changing the zoning district, you're just adding an overlay. So 66 feet is pretty standard for all of our zoning districts unless you get into industrial or commercial zoning districts. Well, from my perspective, from what I saw yesterday, even if, even if you wanted to widen it, you know, another eight feet from what it is. Looked to me like it'd be pretty extraordinary work because that hillside, somehow or another, is going to have to be protected. Yeah, it's it's very steep on one side and straight up in the air, basically on the other side. Um, I, if you're go ahead, you got one more comment. Yep. And in that same Pennington County implement implementation program, um, there's also some implement, implementation actions. And under action number one, it says the types of land uses allowed under a PUD overlay would be limited to those allowed by the underlying zoning designation on the, prop, on the properties involved. And I would assume that means that it would revert back to what ag allows, is how I read that, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, and ag does not allow for concerts, you know, or music venues, um, or, or basically commercial businesses. That's all I've got if you've got any more questions. Okay. Any, any more questions? Of Doug? Jeremy, if, if Doug, if they do the PUD overlay, that's, what's, that's what they're changing, meaning on the overlay, they're changing, changing the use. So. What is the underlying zoning then? That would be the, the ag? I don't, what is it now? It's ag right ag, now. No. And now they want to do a PUD overlay on ag? Um, then I think they can, if I'm correct, Megan, they can. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Yep, thank you. Zachary.
Commissioners, thanks for having me today. My name is Zach Haig. Uh, my wife and I own 25 acres that directly borders the proposed site of the Rushmore Music Festival and Bed and Breakfast. Um, we're to the south and to the west. Uh, I want to start out with kind of telling just what the, <clears throat> our lot represents to us. It represents years of hard work, 20 years of military service, years of higher education, which is a lot of careers to... Um, basically finance a residence in the Black Hills. It represents 15 years of dates with my wife to where we drove the hills to look at lots that were for sale. So this was a lot that went into picking our lot. Most importantly, it represents where we want to raise our kids and where we want to retire. So, I mean, make no mistake, while I strongly oppose the PUD, I'm just as much protecting my dream as, as they are theirs. So when we purchased our land, we looked at what it was zoned for. It's zoned for agricultural use. That fits what we want to do. Um, we want our kids to have, have some animals and for the 4-H projects and that kind of thing. Uh, we picked Klondike Road because it has limited traffic due to the road. There's plenty of space between neighbors um, versus buying a commercial or residential lot. Um, so when we heard from Brett and Katie that they were going to build a music venue uh, and a bed and breakfast, um, that's going to have a constant flow of traffic in and out of the community, we can, became very concerned. So if you look at your personal residence and everything that's in the PUD and how you would feel about, uh, you know, students coming in daily for daily music lessons, large group training sessions with 20 to 30 individuals on site for 24-7 for weeks at a time, concerts with up to 100 people in attendance and 40 cars cutting through, like you just said. Uh, or, yes, it's an easement, but it's still land that we own. Um, and then on top of that, running a bed and breakfast, uh, it, when all of the stuff I just mentioned is not going on. So this is, a, this is something that's going to be year-round. And, I mean, it's, it's the perfect place for an Airbnb. So it's going to be booked up all the time. Um, to accommodate this, they'll have to build two, two dormitories, which you saw in the picture, add 10 to 12 cabins and parking lots. Um, so this is my main point of contention. This is, this is a commercial investment. It's a commercial business. They're, they should be building us on land that's made for commercial use, in my opinion. So if, if all of us want to do something like this, I have 25 acres if I want to build an equestrian center and you give me the permission to do what they're doing and somebody else wants to do a wedding venue and this and that, I mean, this whole area of the hills is just going to be wrecked. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it from that standpoint. Um, as we left the, the meeting last week, we talked a lot about the music festival and, um, and what that entails. But when, when I left, I was like, well, we didn't really even hardly touch on the bed and breakfast. That was barely even brought up, if at all. So bed and breakfast, Airbnb, whatever you want to call it, to me is a far greater risk to my privacy out there in the solitude of that, that land than the music festival. But I talked to Katie the other night for 20 minutes, and unfortunately, probably after that community, that communication, we're probably both more frustrated than, than we were prior to that. So, which, which she stated is the bed and breakfast is, is gonna be used, they're gonna limit it, limit it to three groups. Uh, three individuals, three groups. And if you saw those uh, dormitories, that, that can house a lot of people. That's a lot of possibly big groups. I did a little bit of looking around through kind of the Pennington County policy manual on bed and breakfast. Um, and I don't know if Airbnb specifically or vacation rentals, but it's supposed to be limited to a five bedroom, five bedrooms, I guess is what's in the policy. And in the PUD, we've got five, bed, five bedrooms for the faculty, six bedrooms for students, and two bedrooms for chaperones. And I don't know if that is on top of the bedrooms that are already in their personal residence or not. Um, but just that number of people, that number of, of uh, overnight stays all the time, is equivalent to a small hotel. Um, so to me, that's, that's just unacceptable. It's not, not what I want to live next to. Um, you know, Katie also is like, well, just give us a chance. Give us, you know, you won't have tourists running around your, your, uh, your land, even though we directly border them for sure. You know, we'll be able to take care of that. When just a couple of weeks ago, my wife was out there and ran into her mom and her mom's significant other, who her mom's on the board, and they just indicated that they'd just been up to our building site, which we're in the, in the process of building right now. We've owned our lot for six years. 
um, to check it out. It's like, well, if you can't control your, your own family and your own board members or they don't know where the lot lines are, then how about tourists? So um, that's, just, that's just what tourists do. They, they explore. You know, that's, what, that's why they come to the Black Hills. Um, so they also keep telling us, don't worry about the traffic. It's not going to be as much traffic as you think. I mean, just, that's a totally false narrative, especially with the bed and breakfast. There's going to be tourists coming and going, cleaning crews, um, extra garbage collection, cooks, their food delivery, uh, along with all the activities for the music camp. It is, it's going to greatly increase the burden of traffic to this area. So you've already heard a lot about Klondike Road. And I'm just going to say it again here while I'm on the record. Um, so when I first reached out to Brett last fall after the first, um, I don't know if you call it beauty or whatever it was, for a, what I had heard was a two-week two music camp. Uh, I called him last fall, and we talked, and you know, kind of told me a bit about, about the plans, and and I said, well, you, the biggest concern would be the road, and he's like, oh yeah, the county's definitely going to have to widen that road, and, you know, that's got to be a two-lane road if we're going to do this. And that, it was at that time that I informed him that that's not a county road, that's a privately owned road with an easement. Um, the people out there, are the property owners, take care of the road, and that's the way we like it. Um, so that was the first time, as far as I know, that, that he realized that that's not a public access. Or it is a public access, it's not uh, publicly owned. So to me, what I've just described, the, the traffic coming out is a, is a complete misuse of the easement, which was originally in place to allow property owners to access their home sites. So on top of my concerns with Klondike Road, I want to bring up the safety of the traffic coming from Highway 16. A, a few of you, if not all of you, have been out there. but. When I go out there and I'm approaching from Rapid City, you have to slow way down in the passing lane on Highway 16. And you kind of just slow down enough that you don't go out of control when you're pulling off into the, the swale um, of the road that separates the north and the southbound traffic. And then you wait for the, the oncoming traffic to clear. So without a turning lane, this is, is you know, like Doug said, it's dangerous for us, but be far more dangerous for a bus full of kids. Or when you have multiple cars pulling off at the same time, uh, as as there would be with a concert, um, or tourists who, who don't know exactly where it is, because it's, right now you can barely you can, you can just drive by it and barely even notice it's there. Uh, so, you know, for, I realize the music festival and their business and Airbnb and everything is, is their dream, but I just ask you to, to as commissioners, to take a look at um, the other property owners that, that own the land off Klondike, because we we too have spent our lives investing. Uh, financially and emotionally um, to kind of make our dreams come true. Um, so I, I, I believe if, if this all went through, it's going it's to ruin the solitude. It's going to ruin the privacy of, of our land. Um, so I'd ask that you permanently disqualify Klondike for commercial development, specifically disapproving all business associated with the Mount Rushmore Music Festival and Bed and Breakfast. I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Appreciate it, Zach. Thank you. Thank Jeremy. you. Next uh, person I have is Trudy Brassfield. Jeremy, can, Brittany, can you tell me again, I think Ron asked, what was their conditional use on this property for? I believe it was for the music festival. So what had happened during that process when they originally, um, this goes back up quite a ways. This goes back originally to a building permit that was submitted with the two dormitories. That's what kind of triggered all of this as we received that building permit. So then we went to the conditional use permit. Um, when we looked up the Black Hills Music Festival, when we do our research for the permits and we looked at their website, we were like, this is not like really what they were asking for. That was something that was discussed during the planning commission meeting, hence why they went to the planned unit development overlay. So did they so, ask for, I'm sorry, Miss Brittany, did they ask for, they already have a conditional use permit or they were asking for one? They, they were ask? asking for one. Okay, I thought when and Ron I, asked, he asked what was their CUP for, meaning I thought they already had one. Mm -hmm. So first, that's why I said, I think they've came in more than once. They wanted a CUP first. Correct. It didn't fit the CUP because of the number of uses now, now they're coming back and they're saying they still want the same thing they the staff just said that's not a CUP that's this correct because they do have a single family residence they have dormitories and then they want to have the music camp or the music school um, all of those 
with the exception of the single family residence and in the, with the bed and breakfast or short term rental, however, um, that puts it above the number of uses that under a CUP. So that's why it's a PUD overlay. But right now, the only thing, what, how many buildings? There's just one single family residence on there right now. Correct. That's what I'm, that's what they're building right now. Okay. Their septic is sized for all of the stuff that they want on that property, but the single family residence is what's being constructed right now. Okay. That's what I needed to know. Thank you. Don't, don't go too far. No. <laughs> I got a question too. You know, with the conditional use permit, you have a, after a year, you, you review it. Any complaints come in, you, you review it be, before that. It's complaint based or whatnot. With this overlay, PUD overlay, what kind of protection do the other residents have? I mean, Say they try it for two or three years and then sell it, and the PUD goes away. Can it go away, or, or does it stay with the property? Um, what kind of protections do the, the surrounding residents have with the PUD? Is it going to be reviewed in another year, two years, or is it on a complaint basis? So a PUD overlay does work like a CUP. That's why we got rid of the PUD zoning, because once that zoning went into place, it was difficult um, to, you know, change it for or against, whatever, or, um, because it's actually changed the ordinance. It's like a rezone. Um, so with the PUD overlay, it's like multiple conditional uses. So they are conditioned. Okay. So you can do conditions that can be reviewed. Uh, when staff did meet with uh, the applicants last week, we did talk about that, about, you know, successors and what would happen if the property was sold, um, if, you know, that they would be agreeable to some kind of deed restriction or removal of the PUD, removal of buildings, removal of uses. So that has been discussed with the applicants as far as proposing any kind of future conditions. Um, and that's what they would like to do. Um, and that's why they're going to ask for the continuance because they would like to put together some conditions for review to see if that would be something uh, moving forward that could be considered. The reason why I ask that, Brittany, is because I think when I did a conditional use permit of mine, I think I'm probably maybe one of the only ones I've seen so far that a restriction was on that if I sell the property, they have to reapply for the conditional use permit. It doesn't go with the property. Is, is that accurate or am I just think I'm getting picked on? No, um, actually vacation home rentals, when you transfer the property, they do have to um, reapply. Okay. So they have to do a transfer. So that's all vacation home rentals. After me. <laughs> no. <laughs> All of them have. So. Thanks, Rudy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, Trudy. Well, I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. <laughs> I'm Trudy Brassfield, and my husband Dale and I own property on Klondike and have since 1999. We are ranchers in western South Dakota, and this is going to be our dream retirement home. <laughs> And um, anyway, go, going back to this, the only permit that Katie and Brett have is to build a private family home. They came in the first time um, was held on September, where is it? In September 27th, we came in, and at that time they found out it wasn't a public road. They found a lot of information and they withdrew their request. Nothing was said to us. The building went on. They went forward with all their plans with only permit to build a single family home. Then we are given this PUD. And of course it did scare all of us. But if we could bring up the picture of their proposed plan, could we do that please? Yes, that's, that's fine. Okay. That'll be good. That'll be great. Okay. So I went, they brought this up at the meeting and I went, oh my gosh, that's a campus. And then I went, no, it's, it's a, it's, it's a children's home. And I was like, oh my gosh, if this would be on a multiple choice test, it would not be a single family home. 
This is a commercial. I believe you all received letters. I'm not going to stay up here a long time, and you know that what Dale and I, how, how we feel about this. Um, I, I don't want the road. I want the road is fine. We can put up with it. We've we've maintained it. We've we've drove on it. It's not a problem for us. Um, there was a in 1920s Fred R. Bernard. He was an advertising executive, and he made a pop. Uh, a proverb that we all use, and it became very popular. And it says, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think if you look at this picture, you can see what this is going to do. And this is not going to be, uh, I think this is going to be a commercial business, and it's not in harmony with the existing land uses, which is an established residential area. And because of this, we would like to request the denial of the PUD for Brett Walfish and Katie Smirnova. Questions? Thank you, Trudy. If I have one more, in closing, yes. I, I empathize with them, but I feel they didn't do their homework. And now, a bed and breakfast, and we ran out of money, and we have to find some way else to, to promote this. Um, it's a nonprofit. Nonprofit can come in. They're saying a company can come in and have a retreat if they pay $7,500 for a cabin that has electricity and air conditioning. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Thank last, you. The last one I have is I have uh, Ross and Judy Rohde. I actually put my thoughts together late last night, and I sent out an email, and, and I, I, I did get one response, but it was very late, so I didn't expect that any of you had a chance to look at it, so I'll just read it real quickly to you. Uh, we purchased land up on the Klondike Road some time ago with plans of building our retirement home there, and we are very close to making that happen. We chose the area because it's beautiful and far enough away from the city to be completely away from any and all commercial activity. It was strictly a residential area, and we were confident no one would ever want to change that. For the time being, we are pulling a nearly 40-foot uh, fifth-wheel trailer in, mostly on weekends. The current owners, uh, homeowners all know that we come and go, and they're careful to watch for us. Um, we can claim that we've had quiet enjoyment of our property all the years that we've owned it. Um, if a party is allowed to bring in a bed and breakfast and a music festival, all that changes. We would no longer have the undisturbed presence of our homes and property. We understand the home being built is 4,300 square feet. That would also allow for small family reunions, weddings, business retreats, or whatever. Even if they don't intend to use it for those functions, there will be no one to police that and keep the next owners from doing any of those activities or more. Um, you add in two A-frame homes, and that makes it even more likely considering there'll be 40 parking places. At the past meeting, it seems like the problem was pointing towards the size of the road. The road's not the issue. We love our little country road and we don't want to see it changed. The issue is that we don't um, want to see the commercial activity in the area. It's always been meant to be residential. It was mentioned several times at the past meeting that it's not a business. They were reported that they will not take no income from the music festival. There are many, um, however, however, a business is a business, whether it's profitable or not. Uh, a bed and breakfast and an Airbnb is a very profitable business. There are many suitable places in the Black Hills to hold a music festival. There are many beautiful venues that are zoned appropriately and that would love to hold and profit from a festival. There are many great commercial lots on the market that would work just fine, and I think there's probably 10 of them between Klondike Road and Rapid City. Um, we have no issue with the proposed home as a home. We invite the new owners to enjoy the quiet and peacefulness as the rest of us have for many years and hope to continue to do so. We are hoping not to have to make Plan, change our plans of retiring in our residential area away from all of the commercial areas and all that brings with it. 
And make no mistake, we're all passionate about music, but there are more appropriate places to have this venue. It would be a sad day when one party's dream can take away the dreams of all the long-term residents. So we are asking that you don't allow it. I appreciate you listening. Thank you, Judy. Ross, anything? You know, everything that I had to say has pretty much been said by either Doug, Zach, my wife. Um, the only thing I got is I got a lot of questions. You know, it's like, we've, me and my wife, we had to go through the painstaking process of getting all the proper, proper approval to, to build our land that we bought in Rapid City in 93. And uh, we de did a lot of development over the years on, on our land. And we had to, we've been down here before several times, but everything we done was approved before we done it. You know, there was no way, I mean, we didn't, we didn't move a piece of dirt until we got everything okayed. And I'm wondering how come, how come this is happening? Why, how did it get to this point? You know, shouldn't have, like I said at the last meeting, I think uh, the cart was put ahead of the horse, big time. It's like they knew, I mean, all this was, well, you can see that. That's been, what they say, six years in the planning or however long they said it was. Why did they buy this land and think that they was going to do this without getting approval ahead of time. Mr. Ross. Thanks. I know it's, right. your, it's your time to speak, but number one, I don't think people know the whole process. And number two, these, these are younger people. And that doesn't give them an excuse. But even people that have been in this uh, community for a long time, I didn't say it was okay with this commercial development on this property, but um, there also is a learning curve to a certain extent for many people, not just these two younger people here. Um, like I said, I, I don't think they understood everything in this process um, and fully understood. I don't think most of us do until we get, I, I didn't until I fully got into politics. Um, so um, for me, like I said, I, I think if there's some kind of compromise where they can still do some of their music on their property, I don't know, it sounds like they got a big enough house and still have some kind of compromise where they're not putting in a full-blown commercial on there or something, but still do their little bit of their dream is a good way to put it. I don't know if there is that kind of compromise between any of you, um, but like I said. Um, I mean, you look the, at that picture, that's not just a, a little. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that picture, I'm saying in general, sir. Um, that's a commercial development. Um, it's got Airbnbs and stuff on there. Um, not by state statutes, not commercial on Airbnb, but um, I like their dream, but I, I think at this point, I'm gonna be up straight. I think trying to put um, music festival and the, and the things with the Airbnb with a couple more cabins and things like that on your property um, with that road. Uh, people keep saying it's that road, but it's also um, a residential area. So um, I like their dream. <laughs> I do too. Yes. I like their dream too. I just think it's in the wrong place. But um, yes, yeah, so hopefully there's some kind of compromise where they can do somewhat of what they want to do um, on the, in their big home and still be able to have peaceful enjoyment for everybody else in the neighborhood. But if you're asking, like I said, why don't they know, why didn't they plan like you guys? Um, there's a there's a lot of people that come in here. You've seen a guy with a road. He wants to build his dream house. He's got a barn, and he's like, oh, I don't got enough money to put that big. I'm I'm not doing that road. I'm not even gonna build my house. So, um, you've seen that. And it's good you guys watch that as well. Um, these ones are a little bit younger than that, and going through the process as well. So there's got to be a little bit of compassion in there for a certain extent, and the other, uh, they have to understand now. Um, you guys aren't trying to be mean to these people. These, this couple here, you're saying this is a residential area with a road that's built for a residential area. Um, and you love their dream, just like the rest of us, but uh, it's a hard sell in a residential area to put their dream um, 
in this area. So this is South Dakota. We respect our neighbors and we do it the right way. So I'm I'm listening. You don't sound mean in a sense, but you're asking. Uh, I'll just tell you, I'm answering your question for why they probably didn't know in a sense. Um, hopefully, well, from what I understood, it's a hard lesson for them. I guess, I mean, there's a little more to this than just this. I mean, from the way I understood it, they had plans of doing this in another spot and got turned down. So they kind of had an idea of what was ahead of them yes, sir. here as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, one last shot. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I know it's lunchtime for everyone. Um, I just wanted to address a couple. I've been taking some notes, um, trying to address some um, some misconceptions. Um, some it, It's been a long process. Um, with the idea of a private road, we've known this was a private road. There's a big sign on, the, on our tree that says private road. We've It's actually been... One of the first things that we've, we've been talking about is how to make it safe because our elderly parents come visit us. Um, my, my stepfather had a stroke. I mean, he, he drives very slowly. He's not capable of backing up a quarter of a mile. So one thing that we've done already to address that um, is we put pull-offs. Um, off um, Klondike Road so that someone doesn't have to back up more than, you know, 50 to 100 feet. So we're, you know, we're, we're going to be living in a community with eight other people. Um, and we have a one lane road and we knew this wasn't safe. And we knew that there was some cost in, in trying to improve that. And we'd like to do that for all of our neighbors because, you know, God forbid anything happens to us or our neighbors and an ambulance can't get in and some and we have a snowstorm. We we've been up and down that road for the past two years looking at the property, seeing where we're going to build. Um, there's not a single time that road has been plowed. You know, we, we're trying to think, oh, how how are we going to how are we going to do this? Are we going to buy a truck? Are we gonna pay someone to plow? So if no one else will do it, we will. Um, that's one thing that um, we have been thinking about from the very beginning, um, but on, on the side of doing our homework, so three years ago was when Brett's aunt passed away, and she's actually the reason why we're in South Dakota. She's the only person in our family who believed we should move here, um, and we started out with our real estate agent uh, who sold us our current house. We, we started with her showing us all of the commercial properties. That is where we started. Before that, we were Black Hill State University. They were lovely, but what, the reason why we wanted to get away from the university is because of the rising costs, because we were such a small group that they couldn't have people on campus to cook the food for our kids. Our counselor had to buy pizza out of his own pocket. So that's why we knew we had to we had to move and we had to make a change. So we talked to our agent. We we said, "What's the next? What's the next step? If we you know if we do a com if we do a commercial land, what what can we do with it? We can't live there. We're a three week festival. How how do we you know we have a hundred thousand dollar budget and that includes mostly paying our couple teachers, getting their flights, um, feeding them." Um, you know, some field trips for our kids, that, tuning the pianos, that, that's our $100,000 budget. It is not within our budget to afford a commercial lot. And you know what the value of the land today is going for. So if it's, if it's commercial or nothing, we have no place in the Black Hills. Miss Katie, um, bottom line is um, your neighbors are right. <laughs> you have to do your homework. Yep. You're not on a commercial road. You want, um, whether you think so or not, my personal opinion, you want Airbnb with more people on a road that isn't plowed. You might plow it, but it's still a safety factor. <laughs> on a 24-foot road, you heard about it today, 18-foot road. doesn't even look like it. looks like about a 12- or 10-foot road. I don't know how big it is. Um, for me, um, I'll be up straight. It, if you want people in your house and everything, um, to have some music in there, I don't think uh, people can deny you that. To put what you want on this road in this area, um, your realtor should have been up straight. 
it's it's not a commercial area. It's a residential area. Sure. So what you're wanting to put is commercial in an area that's residential. So that's why you're having the problem you're having, Katie. It, we're, I don't think anybody, even your neighbors, are against what you're saying. Sure. We're saying it's not commercial. Yeah. It will be a commercial residence without a commercial road. It's a private access easement. We also, or I also believe in property rights, but I also believe that the other folks around you have property rights. So you gotta have somewhat of a compassion as well for what they're saying, because that's the bottom line. You moved in a residential area, and now you wanna put commercial in it because it's your dream, and they're right. That's your dream, but it also is in an area that's made for commercial. Commercial would be, like I said, on a minor arterial, maybe a major arterial, Maybe one, uh, switching your house in the summer sometimes for Airbnb that wouldn't increase the traffic if you're wanting to make extra money, that kind of thing. But putting any kind of more residences or more um, development in there um, causes more issues. So it's about safety for me as well for the residents in that area. Your other private access easement is for people that are on there that are taking that risk and saying, I'm willing to take that risk. You're bringing people out there like your father and other that you said you had to, you had to have pull-offs. You had to have different things. Well, that tells me there's a safety factor on that road. Yeah. So you putting in on this road doesn't sound like they want a 24 foot road on there, which is going to cost you tons and tons of money on a private access easement. So all these things in your mind that you want with your dream is amazing. But on this area, I'm gonna stay up straight. It's probably not gonna work. So can I address a couple of those things? Yes, ma'am. So when we looked at this lot, um, one of the things that we looked for specifically was another zoning that's not commercial where we could use it for a temporary use, which would be three weeks. We looked specifically to see if there are any HOAs or any covenants. This particular lot has no HOA and no covenants. And when I at one point stopped at the county, and I said, could we host a small music camp uh, at our home? Uh, I was told that that's a conditional use that we would have to apply for. And one of the things I, I know that with this PUD, it, it has become this 100 person event. We are willing to take that entirely off the table. So our, you know, where we do align with our zoning, and this is where we, we thought we aligned with it, and it looks like we can probably work with the county to ensure safety is that Ag zoning allows for family, children's home, and daycare programs. And I feel like with the size of our home, which is 7,000 square feet about, um, that is our primary use. So I know it looks as a, as a document, um, a commercial use. What we're looking for is to be able to host our kids. Right now we're relying on on our volunteers and our board members to have you know five, six kids at their home. Um, we'd like to just host all 18 of them. And that's what really we're asking. Um, you know, we're, we're not trying to change the cultural, you know, the, the landscape. We're not putting any additional permanent structures. You know, the way that we see it is this is our home. The reason why it looks the way it is, is because we couldn't afford to have a an engineer design a custom 7,000 square foot home. So we actually decided to go with kit home companies. And we we followed all the the laws that the planning and zoning has for single family residents because at the end of the day that is what um, what we will be using it most of the time. We don't see this as a music venue, you know. We don't have a a, a concert barn or anything like that. We have a living room, and that's the only place we would like to you know make music, you know. We, with the the cabins there are 12 by 12 little sheds just to have enough space to hold a music lesson um we have five you know five six teachers we have violin viola cello piano and bass we have five instruments um you know none of the we're willing to take on any conditions to you know remove those structures to ensure that no one else has any use for them um we're not trying to make this a resort 
we're, you know, this is where we would like to live. We'd like to have our, our parents visit and, and stay um, with a little bit of separation from us. Um, but, you know, and, and even with our festival, there won't be any traffic actually leaving our, our home because the students are actually practicing and rehearsing and, and, and then lessons from literally 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So our, you know, I feel like there's a little bit of a misconception of what kind of traffic we're going to be adding. Um, you know, when the whole place is built, all the kids will be staying with us. Katie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there. Um, I need a motion to continue this until May 17th. So moved. We've got a motion. Second. And a second to continue until May 17th. Um, any further discussion by the commission? Uh, Mr. Chair, I might just say that it'd be nice if there could be some dialogue between you and your neighbors between then. So we don't have any sticker shock on May the 17th. Would you be willing to facilitate that? I feel like I've, I've reached out on deaf ears. I'll, I'll do whatever I can. But, uh, we would appreciate it as, as in your district. All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everybody coming today. What time will that be? Yeah. Well, it'll be scheduled at the 1030 time slot, but as you saw today, it depends on how much is on the agenda. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Will we get a notice? No. Okay. May 17th at whatever. Maybe you have a contact person that you could have Brittany call if you want to know when that May 17th meeting. Miss Brittany. That way you can contact everybody. Item 23. Yeah. Yes. Online, sir. Holly, you're up. <laughs> I think. Uh, yes, commissioners. Item 23 is just to um, give you a heads up or notice that it's time to start considering any possible resolutions for the Black Hills District meeting on any legislative changes that you want to see for next year. Um, I will tell you that you'll be asked to consider one change uh, that Treasurer Janet Saylor will be bringing forth um, that she would like Commissioner Drews to carry to the association, the commissioner side of the district. Um, and that will be a change in state law on the amount that she is allowed to collect for mailing of license plates. Currently, we're losing money um, in the mailing fee because of it hasn't been updated for since I think 2008 or 2009. Um, so it's definitely time to get that statute updated so that they can recover the cost of actually mailing a plate. Yeah. Next meeting for that is uh, May 19th, so if she could have the details to me on that, I'll present it at that time. Okay. Is there anything else the commission would like staff to look into um, in regards to any other changes that anybody has? I mean, we certainly can put this on the next meeting agenda. We have until... Um, June, too. Well, I think the other thing that's going to take place here is that with the uh, summer study committees, uh, there may be some things from that. I mean, the property tax uh, study, the jail study, correction study. Uh, I'm missing one in there because there's four, four different ones. But there may be some things there from that as those discussions are taking place that we may want to take consideration in of offshoots from the main thing too so and I'll certainly reach out to the department heads and see if there's any other statutes that they need to look into having change and maybe Good. have the board carry as well Good. Okay, thank you okay uh, item 24 letter of support for the South Dakota Department of Transportation for the US 385 project from US 16 to Pactola Dam for the Multimodal Project Discretionary Grant Program. Commissioner Rosconnect. Well, uh, I've, I read that email from Ben Osborne with the South Dakota DOT. And I called him and, and uh, basically asked for our support to, to send a letter of support to the 
Honorable Pete, uh, how, do you, how do you pronounce Pete, that? Budovich. Yeah. And I'm all for that because what in 2023, where I live at, which would be Calumet Road, and that's the headwaters of Sheridan Lake, uh, to Spring Creek, that's going to be the first phase of that. It's just basically a, a road widening project, but they're talking about shutting 385 down, uh, possibly when school gets out in 2023 and opening, opening back up and uh, fall of two, uh, 2023 when kids go back to school. And then the next phase will go from Sheridan Lake Road towards Pactola. So if there's anything we can do to expedite that process, I would be in full support of that. Uh, Is that a motion? And that would be my motion. Second. I've got a motion and a second. <laughs> Sorry. For that. that was hard, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, for the chair's signature on that letter of support. Yes, sir. All those in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Item from commission members. Let's do let's do both committee and uh, anything else that you may have, Commissioner Travis. <laughs> uh, all right. So, last couple of weeks, uh, obviously we had our ARPA meeting and our budget fund up there. Um, I've also reached out to. It's good that we were talking about the summer committees. I reached out to Trish Ladner about the property tax committees and it looks like they're going to rope me in on some of the subcommittees on that to have some conversations dealing with the ag property and and others in that one so i'll let y'all know as that goes moves forward um spent time at the new underwood fire department uh meeting just recently with them and their um, fire district board and working through some issues out there and um spent some time uh yesterday actually with uh, sheriff tome uh barry tice um, over to care campus, I had received a complaint about uh, an individual that had spent some time there and I was just getting some follow-up information. So it was good information to have to be able to walk through there and get some very specifics. I've been over there a few times to see the process, but sometimes you don't understand the process until you have a complaint about the process that didn't really get a, a good overview. So it was a pretty good, uh, pretty good visit over there. Um, I'm setting up, I'm working with the uh, EPA, Sadita, and the base to set up another follow-up meeting post of our community uh, meeting that we had. That's kind of finding itself a, a, a challenge to get all of us together because we're all got different schedules right now. And then, um, then my committee report is I was at the Community Health Center. Uh, Lloyd LaCroix was there at, at the same time. We pretty much went over all of their policies and pr procedures review. We updated a lot of different things, or they updated a lot of different things. And outside of that, I don't think there was anything that was remarkable from that meeting. And unless Commissioner LaCroix has anything remarkable from that meeting, I would pass it on to him. Remarkable. Hey, remarkable. Yes, that's, that's a term I've learned for that, for meetings like that. <clears throat> Thanks, Travis. That, so I'm going to take that off mine right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that one of the other reports I appreciate, Mr. Drews, I totally forgot, didn't put Black Hills Council Local Governments in my, in my, I didn't, I had a meeting that night and that, that was uh, community health, I had that one, but I didn't have Black Hills, so I missed that, and, but Mr. Drews attended it. Um, I guess I have a question for the, the commission since we're here. The building committee, you know, we had that meeting and that went, there's a lot of stuff on that agenda, so it ends up running a little late. But uh, is it better, would you guys like a copy of those notes in your boxes? I think that's kind of a good, not so much an email, but just, you know, the minutes, here they are. That way you can review them. I think a couple other committees do it. We've been, we've been, get, we just now been getting them and it's good, yeah. Lloyd. I meant, I brought it up a while back. That's why I think they did this last, because that way it kind of keeps you guys up on date on some of the projects that are happening. If you have a question, you can check them. So if that's something I think I think turned the last minutes around pretty quickly. That was a nice. Yeah, it was. So, I got them. Yep. So I think that way, no, none of us are in, seem like we're in the dark. You have the minutes if you want them. So um, I appreciate it. The other <laughs> thing that I attended, you know, we had that uh, learning forum on racial prejudice and our economy. That was well attended. Um, I think we had a hundred and this is from the MOA Human Relations Commission. 
Um, I think we had 120 people there. I mean, there was a lot of people, and it was, uh, these are structured learning meetings. Not, it's not open mic night. You know what I'm saying? So it's, they're structured questions, and I think it went well. We, uh, we had Elevate Rapid City there with Tom Johnson, um, uh, leaders from the LNI, the Powwow, and NDN, and a few more. And Marnie Harmon was the narrator of it, and she did a really good job. Um, and we're going to do more of this. I gave a presentation, well, I did, but uh, Karen Mortimer and a group of us gave a presentation last night at the uh, city council meeting. Uh, on this and what what our plans are in the future as far as doing more educational and learning stuff because I believe that's what human relations is all about. And we gave a report on our trip to to uh, Pine Ridge that we took. And I think I've already reported on that. So the only other thing that I wanted to bring up is, is I've had a phone call Friday from Mr. Bill Freitag and, and uh, his concern was that when we, we were talking about these, these funds for Rap the Valley, that he feels that there's other ways to come up with money. Because I made the comment during the meeting that I would like a revolving fund. You know, we're going to give $5 million. I'd like, and I mentioned this to Rusty in our first meeting. Uh, so Bill must have taken this to heart and decided he'd like to have a committee of five to find a way to create a fund. He, he's, he feels he has a way to do it. And I asked him how, and he, I think it has to do with tips and so forth. Um, my, my concern with Rusty was the tap fees and so forth, but I was pretty direct with Bill. I, I just don't have the time. Uh, I, I get what he wants to do, and I expressed him. I said, I'm booked up to June, July. I, I just don't have the time. And then so he brought up Travis or, or Deb if they'd like to do that. If you guys aren't willing to, I'll, he, he can wait. I'll, I'll sit down and talk with him or try to do something. But it, I just, uh, it's not, I thought I'd bring it to the, to the light of the commission of, of the phone call. So, uh, that's all I'm doing. And I, if, if you guys want to reach out to them, that's fine. If not, I'll stick with. I'll, I'll, he already called me too, Lloyd. Okay. So, okay. so you, you got the same phone call I did. Yes. Okay. I guess so I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't really understand in, in a certain extent. Um, and, and this is my concern when it has to do with the developer in a committee with what we're trying to do to raise money and stuff. And I don't mean that mean uh, towards Bill, just in general, um, with some of his understanding kind of what he wanted to do and I didn't get it fully. Um, his intent is very um, good, but I don't know if that's appropriate for us to do in this. I mean, I'd have to have more information as a county development group or something. The way I left it, yeah, I'm glad that somebody else had the phone call too, is I, is I said I wanted to reach out to some other people and get some comments and get some feedback before I jump in and say, hey, let's do a committee. <laughs> I, I think I want a little more information, a little yep. feedback, a little direction, that type of thing, but I wanted to bring it to the commission, bring it to light that converse, there's a conversation or... I'm with you, Lloyd. I, I think the what he wanted is uh, is probably good. I don't know without all the information if it was something that we would do either. It didn't at this time unless it, it it's going to change its scope a little bit. I don't know if I was quite interested in what he was talking about, but I like the way he's trying to at least think, you know, outside the box and and you know, he did listen to you. So um if that's moving forward at this time, maybe Travis talked to him too. I don't I don't know but um, it's not always about the time for me. It's just, is it something that that's what our vision, that's what our um, goals are for Pennington County um, in the future. So, I mean, we always want more money to invest in other things, but 
depends on what that is. Like I said, more information. So you're right, Lloyd. Okay. I was going to say, he did call me. I've got a note on my work desk. I actually didn't bring it here. And I've got to mull over what he talked to me about. I think it was along the same line. So I've got to mull over that and reach back out to him and tell him I was a little busy this week to finish up for what we have going on. But then I'll reach back this coming next week and, and talk to him more probably about it, see what he's thinking. Appreciate so that I understand it. Yeah. We're all on the same page. Good. I'm done. Okay. So Black Hills Council of Local Governments, where we sorely miss Lloyd LaCroix's presence at it, but we were able to get through. So there's going to be a slight uh, dues increase or change, I would say, for 2023 uh, for the members in the nine-member district. It has not been a change since 2010. Pennington County is one of the few that will see a slight decrease. See? Oh. That's exciting. <laughs> right in her, right her day. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I knew I had a note on this, Ron, but I forgot what meeting it was at. So at the June 23rd meeting that we'll have, State Highway will give a presentation on how Highway 385 will be closed for periods of time for renovation. Right? So I think that information is going to be available in advance of that okay. nice. also. So. But uh, anyway, 385, as Ron said before, between uh, Hill City and Deadwood, just an extremely yeah. busy road. And then you um, compound that with the tourist traffic during that period of time. And it's going to be quite a challenge. I do have a solution. Ferry across Sherman Lake. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ron's then going. last uh, Thursday and Friday, we had the uh, Central States Fair Board retreat uh, and board meeting. Um, had some excellent discussions for the retreat. Spent a lot of time on capital improvement projects. Uh, John is is really ahead on that ball game, and of course, he's the one that made the presentation and got the 980 thousand from the uh, vision committee too. So uh, he's well in advance on working on those projects. So here's one for Deb. They're going to have a demolition derby. <laughs> Large payout. This is coming in June. You all going to be in the car? <laughs> so this is outside of. I mean, this isn't one being put on by the Central States Fair. This is a vendor that came to them. Well. And uh, so they're having a large payout, and they'll be entering a minimum of 150 cars wow. for the two-day event. Holy cow! So. A week ago or so, they opened up the ticket sales for the grandstand for it. It's going to be huge. Sold out in 30 minutes. Yep. Oh. The demolition oh. derby for Gary for the event, if you go every year, um, it's packed. It's, yeah. it's packed. So you're right. I'd like to get a car and put one in. <laughs> hey, my son's got one that you could probably buy for really cheap to put in there. So obviously, uh, I've not appreciated demolition derbies like I should, and I've I've participated in some years ago and been to some, uh, but this is something else. So um, the the events that Ron talked about today, uh, they're hosting, and and we don't have the one thing that we're lacking right now is uh, some time for some of the. Uh, facilities that we have and so they're having to make some choices on you know who's coming in and being able to use the space during that period of time and uh, which is which is a good thing to have to do uh, from the standpoint that it's keeping things busy but it's just a lot a lot of activity going on so they talk about um, expansion because I know they wanted to bond it sometime and I think is it going to be a have to in the future for them um, to be able to keep doing what they do? And I, I don't think that's always a bad thing. If you already know you have a business, you don't have enough room in order to support what you have there. Yeah. Um, and you're so busy that tells you even at any business that you're going to have to be innovative and, and grow bigger to a certain extent. And some of those events, um, can be bigger and generate the cash flow and maybe that's through i don't know there has been suggestions on a ticket thing and different stuff to increase but um 
Yeah, and I think you're going to see that this year too. Yeah, you're going to I see an adjustment there. And that's good, Gary. But that's like I said, for the future, I think that's something maybe yeah. um, we need to look at. Part of the initial discussion is uh, another facility. Yep, there you go. So trying to maximize the old parking spaces that you have now, and and so you don't have to develop anything more than where the building is going to be, be able to take advantage of all the rest of the amenities along with it. So, Could I pass something on to you, Gary? Yep. Deb and I, I was it about four years ago, maybe? We went to Mayor, and, and back then we were trying to, use that uh, polo field trying to find a use to get that and I think you know we didn't uh, didn't get very far then but you know that's always a possibility too yeah. and, and so much of that is in the floodplain and stuff yeah. I mean it's really limited as to how you can use it but yeah, yeah that's all part of being talked about too they and as use. Ron said today you know cleaning up some of those areas uh, down there just just cleaning up the the brush and the weeds and so forth um, makes some of that more usable. You can build, um, as you notice from Civic Center, you can build parking lots in floodplain. Yep. Or flood yep. ways as flood. well. Yep. So yep. I know that's kind of what they were thinking for expansion if they did a different building, so yep. a bigger building. Commissioner Ross Connect. I drove by there yesterday and uh, I had to take a double take. That really <laughs> looks good. It does, doesn't it? I almost wanted to get my picnic basket off. <laughs> Uh, building committee, Lloyd pretty much talk, talked on it. Uh, point of interest: the courthouse tunnel. There could be some ARPA funds for that, and there and there and Liz also said that, that there's a potential historic preservation grant money uh, available that would have to be kept separate from the counties. Uh, facility needs assessment. That's going to identify a lot of. Uh, issues, the final report received will address how to solve the county's department's space needs over time. And so I think when we get that needs assessment, we're going to find out that in 10, 15, 20 years, the way the county's growing and the way the area is growing, we're going to need more space. Uh, one way we could look at that, who could work at home and, and who can't work at home? That would save some brick and mortar, but I, you know, that Great Western Bank uh, property keeps coming up, and and Kevin Tome sent out a letter from, uh, I believe this lady's with uh, First Interstate Bank, saying in probably six weeks they will have some kind of a decision how they want to treat that. Each floor is roughly 7,500 square feet, so they might they might want to condo it out and just keep that bottom floor for the bank and then the upper two floors would be, they could be sold separately. They might just want to sell the whole property along with that parking lot. So I really, uh, if it comes to the point where that becomes available, I, I really like to look at that opposed to finding another site and building a building from scratch. Just something to be thinking about. We don't need it now, but five, 10, 15 years, that's why we're doing this uh, needs assessment. The Penn County Housing Redevelopment, there's two topics that we talked on. It was kind of a special meeting. One would be, we're, we're gonna go ahead and engage the consultant to uh, pursue the feasibility of doing a repurposing of our housing authority from a HUD platform to a section eight. And we also have an acre of land over off of Catherine Boulevard that Black Hills Works would be very interested in having for a project that they got some grant money from. It would be a six unit apartment building and uh, didn't know it was so hard to buy and sell property, but uh, we're navigating through that process. And I think this is a property that we really don't have any intended use for. If we could uh, sell, sell it at uh, a fair price, then we could shift those funds over into that 70 unit uh, apartment complex that we're looking at uh, by Vicki Powers that uh, we allocated $2 million for earlier this year. And other than that, I think that's all I got, Gary. Mr. Edka. Oh. I got a question for Deb and Gary. With that 70 unit um, uh, over there in Cat Catherine, 
I just heard that NDN, I thought they were buying, maybe I'm wrong, the rest of that property in between there and, and Crazy Horse. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought I heard the news release. Who was going to buy it? NDN. I thought they're, where are they putting their native school at? Is that's, that what, that's where, where they're going to put it? I think so. I, so that, that I, clarify, that, I didn't know if you guys had heard. I'd heard something on the radio about it, and, I, and they said it was over in that, that section, and the only open piece of land is in between the school land and, and Crazy Horse. And, and so I was assuming that the school and all these other ones would be around it filling it in so it's if it, if that's the case then that whole area could just develop. that's, that's a positive then because yeah. it's only going to help for you know affordable housing is what we're doing and, yeah, and they want to do that along with the housing the plan. plan too so another note of interest i've heard that just here say that the children's son could be relocating to rapid city there again that was just hearsay and I, uh, we do have Silver City Fire Department, and we've been working with the fire chief there, and Jim Gupples, who's the district district ranger, and they've pretty well dialed in a uh, site for the uh, substation for the Hill, or Silver City Fire Department, which would be located about a half mile, maybe three quarters of a mile from the current uh, location of the sugar shack, you know where that's at, so... That's getting dialed in, and, and I think they're working on the special use permit, which would be a 30-year uh, lease, more, more or less, similar to the uh, one that the uh, Rochford Fire Department is currently using. So I'm glad to see that's kind of coming together. So speaking of the fire departments, the volunteer fire department station update, you guys should have a, a update in your box. Um, I don't know... I don't think we put in funding for Silver City, but maybe that's what we're thinking about for the budget this year. Um, I know we had said that was one of our goals, but um, something to think about. Um, special meeting that was called for uh, Housing Authority, Pennington County Housing Authority on repositioning. That's what we went to our classes and stuff for. Um, Ron's right, we're getting a consultant there's two that we're, we're choosing from that we'd like to get. The one uh, he taught at our um, at some of our classes, he was really good, and it's Michael. He was really good that we um, zoomed in with probably two weeks before we went on our trip. That's why we got kind of all excited about our trip going. But the selling of the property, Ron's right. He's helping with that, with uh, people he knows to help uh, Jonathan, our lawyer, to make sure that process goes a little bit smoother. Um, and what else do I have? 40 unit rule update. I'm um, working with Brittany and Jason on a 40 unit rule and what we can look at the different aspects of that. Uh, Jason and Brittany are very good at finding different people that uh, can be involved in that with the highway department, um, some of the fire departments, or even Dustin for emergency management. Why do we have 40 unit rule? Um, different areas we are topography different in Pennington County is there different aspects in different areas as we know how we develop here on the eastern side is a lot different than the western so is there some compromise that we can do with those um, 40 unit rules so appreciate everything that planning does because whew, we have overloaded them in the last two years um, and Joe has been a lot of help from as you guys know from highway department just helping fill in with some of the areas that they need help and then um, basically, we have Public Works Director Brittany Molitor and Joe, um, what's Joe's last name? <laughs> anyway, from my highway department. So, got to appreciate those two. They've been working pretty hard with Jason to get some of these things done that we needed to do for infrastructure and everything for Pennington County. So, a lot of work. Um, there's some staff that we appreciate as well. So, um, Lloyd, on your your and I, I'm sorry I missed it. It was a lot on economic development is what I read. Uh, I didn't go to the meeting, but um, what I keep seeing is people forget in Rapid City, Pennington County area, and even in South Dakota, how much the Native American people add to the economic development of this state, this city, and this county. Um, I'm living proof from our, what our businesses do. Um, they are three-fourths of our business. We appreciate uh, Native people. 
Um, I think if the native people pulled out and quit doing business with uh, South Dakota, Rapid City, Eddington County and the surrounding areas, there'd be a big hurt. So um, everybody makes a difference. And uh, I appreciate that they had that. So that information gets out a little bit more about people think it's just about the powwow or just about the basketball game and stuff. But it's the overall impact that they make, uh, the Native people make for Pennington County um, and South Dakota. So uh, I appreciated that they had that meeting, but I'm sorry I missed it. No, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up, Deb, because that's why Ellen and I and the powwow, you know, uh, the powwow itself is, they want to be the number one in the country by 2020. It was supposed to be this year, but we kind of got it fell, they fell behind with COVID. Uh, COVID and stuff. But if you look back at the history of the powwow, it used to be where they headed outside of the tennis courts. You know, when it first started in Rapid City and where it's at now is just unbelievable. But the economic development that, you know, when we gave this report last night at the Rapid City Council, we met with the tribal, some of the tribal councils in their chambers in Pine Ridge, and it was amazing. Their treasurer told us how much money that they're spending in, in Rapid City. I mean, when they go to buy their vehicles, you know, that was $3 million. It was uh, the Lowell's and the Menard's bill. Holy cow. You know, because they're doing a lot of housing stuff. So, I mean, the money is quite quite a bit. And so, and that was one of the things they brought up at this forum there, and we're all aware of, but uh, the economic development from Pine Ridge to Rapid City is just, it's amazing. It's a lot. So, you're right. And that's what was good about that forum is that's what part of it was all about. Yep. So... That was an additional discussion we had at the Central States Fair Retreat too, is how to uh, include more Native American things into it. Uh, taking advantage of those times that they're here of being able to to uh, add into their programs uh, so they get more out of it as they're traveling and stuff but during the LNI, you know. So, I mean, they have a busy schedule at that point in time, but there's maybe some of those that are that are not in, included in everything that's been well, picked up. And you know, one of the things with the L and I is, is they're doing a cultural training, or have the one-on-ones, which is helpful for people that want to learn a little bit more. I mean, it's, it, things have come a long way. You know, on that trip, the immersion program with Lakota language in, in Red Cloud was probably one of the most amazing things I had ever seen. They had the kids who originally started out and then up to three years, because it's three years old now. And that's all, that's how the class is taught, is Lakota language. Teachers, and then you have an elder in the back of the room to help the teachers, because their biggest problem is finding enough teachers that know the Lakota language. Right. But they said uh, these kids are accelerating so much in that short period of time, because I mean, you're getting it from kindergarten to third right now. And they already pick up the, the language or English, but it, it, they just say they're excelling and it's something new and it's good. And, uh, you know, uh, Chiffon Means, I think it was, uh, Dennis Means' daughter, she's just amazing as far as teaching and, and explaining the whole thing out there so we'll be able to have another chance to have i know you guys were out of town and gary was was sick with this we're going to do another one uh i highly encourage you to do it one of the recommendations that they brought back to us after we were done is of still just pine ridge that maybe we go to some other reservations because we're surrounded by the uh, reservations so in a motion to approve $535,811.14 in vouchers. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? And <laughs> it gave us saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, I need a motion to go into executive session. So moved. Got a motion. And uh, second. Second. And All in favor? Indicate by saying aye. 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 Proposed? Motion carried. SD 12521, personal. No, you have me? Personal.
we pay you for them. For them. That's okay. Move to command executive session. Second. We ready, John? Yep. Okay, so I heard a motion and a second. Uh, and what was that? Oh, we'll come back in the session. Okay. So now I need a uh, motion from uh, we got a vote. Ambassador. Don't we have to vote to come out of big sector session? Yeah. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Move to place Cynthia Bittner at DBM B23, step 7, $23.87 uh, $23 an hour, effective April 17, 2022. Is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Move to adjourn. Second. Got a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Holly.